I did not do anything wrong other than some light stalking. And, um... <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Hello. And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Hi. And it's been a while, so we're going to be doing Theater Stories, Woo! Volume 4. That's right. I want to tell you a story. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And leave your bullshit attitude and baggage at the door, because we don't need it. I didn't know we had so many goddamn stories, <laughs> but we do. We still have a few to a tell experience. and everything. But uh, anyway, Jeremy, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Around volume six, by the way, it'll be like this one time I made popcorn. <laughs> yeah. And it was tasty because I put a little extra salt in <laughs> and no one ever found out. Yeah. I had an <laughs> argument with somebody once. That wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my first story might might get a little long because there's a lot of elements of this experience I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. All right, so I was only a general manager of theaters the last two years that I worked for Regal. And one of the ways they try and motivate you to motivate your staff to sell more concessions is they do these combo contests. And they run for, I don't know, four or six months, and you're grouped in theaters of similar size, almost like flights at a golf tournament, mm-hmm. right? So I was competing against other 10 screen theaters. It was basically based on attendance, not number of screens. But um, and I was never going to win one of these things. I was just not a good enough manager. I wanted my employees to like me too much. (laughs) And so I was never going to be the guy who opens the manager's door and goes, sell more combos and then slams it shut. (laughs) Um, But one one six month period some kind of magic happened and we won (laughs) and so what happens when you win totally unfair by the way is the company sends the the general manager and a guest on a trip with all the other general manager winners and a guest the employees get dick all (laughs) yep the ones who actually sold all the combos do they get like a like a a card to a restaurant or something it's like gift card it's like it's like uh here's 20 bucks to your favorite (laughs) restaurant go to applebee's yeah exactly (laughs) so the trips are always different they're trying to make them interesting they they want you to want to go on this trip that so that you'll win the contest like a buddy of mine won one a few years after i left and they sent them to boston Hmm. And they got to go to a, a ball game and tour a brewery, and that was a much cooler trip than what I won. I won a cattle drive. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, this is humorous to me because I've seen city slickers. Yeah. And so, and I was single at the time, um, and so I asked my good buddy Josh, who I've mentioned several times on this podcast, uh, he went to college with me, he was my roommate at this point in time, do you want to go on a cattle drive? <laughs> and he was like, okay, let's do it. Um and so there's about, I would guess, 25, th- 30 theaters that had winning general managers and their guests. Uh, and that was about half the group on this trip. The other half were all the corporate executives. They go on all the trips. Mm. Right? They don't have to sell combos, but they still get to go to Boston and the cattle drive. Of course, this is how executives work. So I've never been to Texas outside of this trip. Mm-hmm. They flew us to uh, Fort Worth and we get there. We're like four hours ahead of the first scheduled event that evening. And so we find this uh, Pizzeria Uno, which I had had from Chicago, I didn't realize was a chain (laughs) in downtown Fort Worth. And so we go in and we get some deep dish pizza. Then they take us out, uh, everybody in these huge buses to this, I think it's a famous place in Fort Worth. There's literally a rodeo ring inside the bar restaurant. Nice. There's like billiards. There's a gift shop that sells jackalope postcards. There's uh, all this barbecue and fixings. And I guess it's some kind of touristy, trappy thing. That was okay. I'm all right with that. Mm-hmm. Then we're leaving the restaurant and they're like, all right, everybody, buses are departing at 430 tomorrow morning. Holy shit. And I was like, fuck. Wow. I don't <laughs> want a cattle drive, but I definitely don't want a cattle drive at 430 <laughs> in the morning. So 430 rolls around. All our groggy asses get on the bus. And then we drive for like two and a half hours out to where I think they shot No Country for Old Men. Jesus. Basically, civilization <laughs> is gone. <laughs> we pull onto this uh 
cattle ranch, which I later find out has like thousands of acres on it. Like they just everywhere as far as the eye can see is their property. And so we pull in and the first thing they do is load us onto these hayride trailers being pulled by tractors. There's two of them. They're ginormous. We're still groggy. So we just we get on and about 30 seconds into this ride deeper into the woods, we realize we're on the one with the executives and yeah. all the other general managers that won the contest and their guests are on the other trailer. And so we're sitting here with the head of concessions on my left and like the VP on my right of like the whole company. <laughs> and we're tired and we're goofballs. Mm-hmm. All right. So now this place employs several real cowboys, mm-hmm. quote unquote, real. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a show cattle ranch they do tour groups right but there are really cattle ranches that have real cowboys that drive the cattle here and there like curly it still exists right uh and some of these guys have done it for show and some of them have done it for real but they're all pretty good with horses and ropes and whatnot and they're kind of trotting along beside us on their horses while we're riding out on this hay ride (laughs) and we don't really know where we're going or anything i was like that's a pretty horse (laughs) and josh said I don't think that's a horse. I think it's a mule. And I was like, maybe it's a burrow. <laughs> and Josh goes, burro. And I go, burro. And then we spend the next 30 seconds treating <laughs> the most <laughs> exaggerated pronunciation of the word burro possible. Just burro, burro, burro. <laughs> Fine. The head of concessions looks up. He's like the fifth guy in charge of the whole company. And he goes, you two are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't like, it wasn't like for fun. Like he was, I feel like he was truly questioning how I could ever have won a combo contest. <laughs> if this is the guy that I am. <laughs> so we just, that just makes us laugh even more because <clears throat> we're idiots. And so we get finally like after a 30 minute ride. So I've already spent three, three and a half hours of my day just riding places. They finally let us off at this cowboy breakfast. This was the best part of the entire trip. Mm. These are five foot wide cast iron skillets on fires Mm, uh, over a fire. There are three or four of them in each skillet. There are shit tons of eggs, sausage, bacon, hash browns and a full fucking pot of coffee. And they're cooking everything over this fire. Nice. And it was one of the best meals I ever had. Hell yeah. Mm. May have had something to do with the getting up at 430 and riding (laughs) for three hours. Being called an idiot by one of my corporate bosses. (laughs) So. After the breakfast, they take us to the gun range, and everybody gets a chance to fire the six shooter. And whoever <laughs> breaks the most glass bottles with the six shooter wins some sort of cowboy prize. Wow! And this entire time, I'm just like, this is one of the worst ideas ever. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I guarantee you, a few of these people are unstable. Whether we're talking about the executives or the th- you yeah. worked in theaters, you know that there's some unstable theater managers out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And we're putting a, a gun with live ammo in everybody's hand, mm-hmm. and the rest of all 70 of us are just standing behind them five feet, watching <laughs> them. If anybody wants to turn and fire, they can't. Yeah. Now, I had at this point and have since never held a gun. Uh, maybe I was just raised too sheltered. I don't know. Um, but it scared the, the thought of it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Like, I was going to ricochet a bullet and kill the... like. <laughs> Like the CEO of the company or something. So I get up there and I you've never seen somebody fire six shots faster than I did. I didn't aim. I just went pop, 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 handed the gun to the person and walked away. I didn't want to win this shit. And then I went to the very back of the group so that if there were a ricochet, I was yeah, really yeah. far away yep. from it. All right. So then they take us to see, I told you this story was long. Then they take us to the actual cattle drive portion mm-hmm. of this cattle drive vacation. This is all in one day. Yes. Holy shit. Damn. And we fly out the next day. It was like wow. a, a two night, one day trip. Man, that's like, fuck that. I would, no up reward. I would not, I would not try. I mean, I, you said it was magic. You won it. I, I, I think it's magic. You lost it. It's what really what happened. I think everybody else was like, I see the prize. I'm not going to win this. <laughs> next year we go to a brewery and a fucking socks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so they, they spend about an hour teaching you how to horse. Mm-hmm. Right. And I had never been on a horse. Oh, yeah. A lot of experiences on this trip were new for me, even though they weren't exactly bucket list for me. <laughs> yeah. Fire a gun, get on a horse, get made fun of by the VP of concessions. Yeah. Um, and so my horse w- would only turn to the right. So I named, quickly named him Zoolander <laughs> uh, nice. because I could not get him to turn to the left. Now, this is when most everybody just started checking out, clicking, talking amongst each other. And they teach us what we're going to do, how you, you know, steer cattle by where you ride your horse. And we go out and we're basically 
traveling with these are, by the way, like miniature cows. Like they may have been calves, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they were like dwarf cows or something. Even one getting away, you'd be like, ah, fuck it. Yeah. Only like 30 pounds anyway. Um, so it wasn't even a real true cattle drive. They weren't big. There weren't any steer or anything like that. So we, we open the gate. We're going to drive them like three miles to this other gate where they have lunch prepared for us conveniently. And I don't know whose idea it was to throw 30 people who are used to calling all the shots and being listened to into a group setting where we try and cooperate with one another because it was literally the first 20 minutes was everyone shouting, go over there, you go over to this, go over there, go over to this, because everybody thinks they know everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then everyone just quit. Everyone just gave up and it became a horsey ride. And Josh and I were the only two people driving the cattle. Wow. <laughs> we started to have fun with it mm -hmm. and we started to get good at it. <laughs> to the point where I shit you not, when lunch was over, the lady who owned the ranch offered us jobs what? if we wanted to be show cowboys <laughs> wow. with the other show cowboys. Because everyone gave up and we single handedly drove like 35 head of cattle, Whoa. just the two of us, all the way to the gate. And, and we were like, we're pretty sure both of our jobs are already better than this. And I don't want to move to Texas to be a show cowboy, but it still felt pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. nice. All right. So then we go back to the hotel. And it's banquet time where everybody's going to get their trophy or their ribbon or whatever the fuck. I don't remember what it was. And you go back into your room and there's a Regal Cinemas uh, embroidered jean jacket <laughs> on everybody's <What>? bed. <laughs> Now, this was 2003, yeah. 2002. Um, jean jackets, not exactly in style. <laughs> right. The bigger issue, they snuck into my room while I was gone. That's right. Yeah, what man. if I had left my underwear out or my strippers yeah. in there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we go down. It's like an hour before the banquet. And everybody's milling around in the bar. And this guy comes up to me. And it's a, it's a district manager that I'd been introduced to, but he's not my district manager. And he goes... Hey, you really shouldn't wear jeans to this thing, because if you do, uh, the CEO is going to say something to your district manager about it. And I was like, what? And this, by the way, is what's wrong with America and corporate America, is that a like a, a CEO of a company is offended if I wear jeans to a shitty banquet after riding a horse all goddamn day yeah, in 100 yeah. degree weather. And I'm like, well, I don't want to get in trouble on a vacation. So we go out and we hop in a cab. And we're like, where's the nearest gap? And he's like, I know it. I'll take you there. 20 miles away, Holy he shit. drives us to a gap. So now it's like 30 minutes to banquet time. And I have never bought a pair of pants faster in my life. <laughs> I knew my general waist size. And I just walked in, grabbed a pair of khakis, flopped it on the counter and said, I need these. Bought them, hustled our asses back, put on the khakis, go to the banquet, 15 people wearing jeans. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> Plus, they gave you a denim jacket. They should be expecting you to exactly. wear fucking jeans. Yeah, come exactly. on. Come on. This is a denim-centric vacation. Yeah, and there's no real climax to this story. There's <laughs> yeah. nothing else that happens of note. I think the gap was the climax. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, we can call it that. But that was a whirlwind trip. Uh, my employees got hosed. Uh, I got offered a job. <laughs> It was a crazy trip, and I've been looking for a reason to tell that story, and theater stories uh, seem like the right place. This is the, the secret life of managers who sell combos good. Jeez. Uh, if only you had taken that job. <laughs> yeah. Think about what would have happened. Would have happened. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm gonna de I decided to stay in Texas. <laughs> Apparently, I'm great at cattle yeah, driving. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, you know what? This isn't, this isn't the story that I was going to tell, and this isn't really a story, but I want to interject on this because you're talking about... Uh, putting a bunch of managers and district managers yeah. and stuff like that together and everything. There is nothing, there is not one bigger clusterfuck than doing that. Oh, yeah. By the way. And they, they want to do this, I don't, I guess, to cover their asses. Like, for instance, uh, th what this reminded me of is when Spider Man 3 had its big premiere and I was living in New York. All right. And they decided to put it in this Kaufman Astoria 14 screen, you know, show it on all 14, have Sam Raimi, have everybody there. Well, there were, so instead of like, oh, let's plan this way ahead and have a month to prepare for it or two months to prepare for it or whatever, they started doing this like the week of, maybe even the day before or hmm. something like that, cleaning the theater up. <laughs> 
and all that, you know, janitors will come in and do their thing, but then, you know, managers will come around and they'll start like doing the real like detail stuff, yeah. like cleaning the cleaning like little things in the in the seats and replacing seats mm. and stuff like that. And I was invited to come along on this, but much after the, you know, 24 hour cleaning session, thank God, I wouldn't have gone on that anyway. I would have been like, I got something to do, but <laughs> like, uh, but like they, they, I got invited to do this. So I, I came in early that morning and, you know, you have every district manager, every regional yep. manager, everybody's there. And like, like Jeremy said, everybody thinks they know what needs to be done in this situation mm. and they all want to appear busy yeah so they go over and they tell somebody to go you know go over here and clean this up and clean that up and everything and you're like okay i get, i mean toby mcguire isn't gonna give a fuck <laughs> <laughs> about the black mark that's on this little piece of fucking wall that you're talking about but sure i'll go ahead <laughs> toby mcguire would actually like flip his shit yeah he, he comes what in the hell is that? yeah, yeah. I'm like, out he's on the red he's on the red carpet and just he can just tell he all, he really does have spidey sense he's just like sitting there going what the fuck? What is this right yeah. here? I want to give this interview, but I'm sorry. I'm too distracted right now. <laughs> there is no theater on this earth that has a black mark on the wall. <laughs> and here you are. You fucking muck my shit up. Um, but like, the, yeah, it's it's annoying. All these people think they know what needs to be done at a theater. And and the the biggest thing for me, uh, and, and because I'm very like you know i don't like authority i mean I, I, i'll i'll do what you say but i hate you and uh and uh but Dad. yeah exactly <laughs> um but like the thing for me that bothered me the most they you know they this is when the 4k projector sony 4k projectors were new and they had technicians upstairs installing one for this premiere to put it you know the day do, before yes holy they might have been there the whole week for That's all i crazy. know but still these were new projectors that the even like even these big technicians were kind of like well uh, mm. and um <laughs> so like they got they they they're putting that in and everything and i got because i'm a projection guy i got to go upstairs and saw it see them you know doing all their stuff and everything mm. but like the thing for me that bothered me the most was after all this bullshit, let's clean up little pieces of, you know, mark on the walls and like, let's clean concessions and make it all look nice and everything. The screen that Sam Raimi watched this premiere on was fucking filthy. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was the dirtiest fucking screen they could have put this movie on. I was sitting there watching it. It looked like people came on it. <laughs> If you have a really big dirty mark on a screen, it's distracting as fuck. Yeah. And it looked like, you know, like somebody maybe threw like, you know, their whole slushy up there once and all that. How I remember you tell the slushy apart from the cum. Um, there's well, you spend as long as I have in theaters. <laughs> you you get to know the texture. The uh oh my God. This is the dirtiest thing ever. <laughs> But like, I, I remember, um, I remember kids, I remember one time going in my old theater, I went into an auditorium once and I saw, and I heard this, this like pop, pop, pop. It sounded like, like those little firecracker things that uh, the, you know, that the kid uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> Boogie Nights is throwing around yeah. and it sounded like that. And I was like, who the fuck is throwing shit like that in a theater? And I was like, and I didn't see anything though. I didn't see like, you know, anything popping. Nobody was like throwing stuff on the ground or anything. I was like, what the hell's going on? And I think I left. I was like, I don't know what the hell it is. So whatever. And then I went back and I heard it again. And I was like, this time I was I'd walk all the way to the front of the mm. theater. And there's these little kids. They're licking gummy bears and they're throwing it <laughs> up against the screen. <laughs> oh, and like i didn't know how many until after the show and it was like 40 or 50 oh of them God. and those things are on there man <laughs> like you can't just you can't just go over there and knock them off they're they're melt they're like melded into it they're like doing their marvel shit to get in there and like and like yeah you have you have to get like i had i had to get one of those things that you you know you change the lights and like the ceiling those like little like yeah, yeah, extender yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
things. I had to use one of those, and like you're sitting there, like like you're just like jamming it into the gummy bear, and it just won't come off or whatever. So yeah, there was stuff like that on the screen too Jeez. at the Spider Man <laughs> Three premiere. Anyway, I think that qualifies as a story. It wasn't what I was gonna go to, but I'm gonna let Jeremy go on. All right, well then I'm gonna segue to a short story real quick that I told once in a video on my personal channel years ago, but have not told in the podcast format. Mm-hmm. And that's the night I got to go to Night Court. Mm. I haven't told this story, right? No. Okay. So one of the things I learned, I don't think you have to be a movie theater manager to learn this. There's probably several professions where you can learn this. But a good life tip is don't wake a strange drunk person without backup. You know, we'd had, we've been having this problem with, uh, there was one homeless guy in particular. This was at Hollywood 27. Mm-hmm. And you would see him late at night out around picking up cigarette butts and beer cans trying to get whatever was left from them. It was disgusting. Yeah. And somehow he was getting in and then the hiding. Theater? Yeah. And oh. then the, the opening manager the next day would see him leaving. Like he was spending the night in a theater. Oh. So this is on everybody's mind, right? Now, this is not about that guy. Not that I remember names or would you know slandering him, <laughs> was, but was this he, is about how yeah was he was he uh was he getting in at night like when you were closing that was my impression because i i mean it could be like the janitor show up it and could he, be and and they've got the doors wide well open and that when they theater it. had the handyman who got racist treatment oh, from yeah, the boss yeah, he yeah. would come in late at night too right um, so there's no telling somebody props the door open to take some trash out. He slipped in. He'd perfected this game. <laughs> anyway, so this is on my mind. We're walking, clearing auditoriums before we close the building. It's roughly 1, 1 30 in the morning. It's a weekend. And I see this guy asleep in auditorium 16 seats, about 500 people mm. shows long been out. I'm like, security, can you come down here with your gun? And the security <laughs> is basically off duty cops and, yeah. uh, help me wake this drunk guy. Um, and so. <laughs> We turn on the cleaning lights and I walk in with the security officer and the guy opens his eyes and sees us Uh and turns. This is one of the three auditoriums at Hollywood that has an upstairs rear entry door to elevator access for handicapped people. Oh, okay. Mostly those back doors were used by us, a projectionist, to step into the back of a show and check out the sound or whatever. But he bolted out that door. (laughs) Now, there are only a couple places he can go at that point because most everything's locked from that hallway he could get on the elevator he's not going to be able to get into the main booth he's not going to be able to get into the district manager's office yeah. and then there's a locked closet there for our paper records only oh. this closet was not locked mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the cop and i run up the stairs cop is of course much faster than me gets there a good five seconds you're before chasing me. after him <laughs> well i'm chasing after the cop at a good distance <laughs> the cop is chasing you know drunk guy who just woke up and he gets upstairs and i hear a scuffle and when i get through the door He's pulling the guy out of that closet. Dude's pants are down. Well, he had started pissing oh, all over oh. our file boxes. These are employment records, financial records, oh. uh, you know, inventory reports. Oh, my God. And he's this is before everything was kept on computers, right? And he's just whizzing all over <laughs> it. Now, this is comical to me. Yeah. Um, how could it not be? <laughs> right then... The district manager decides to leave for the day. What? Because he had his office in our theater at the time and had stayed late that night. Who knows why? But he walks out and starts, of course, if you remember who this was, Chris, he, just, he, he had to know everything about everything. Yeah. Nice guy. Uh, so he starts grilling the office going on here. Blah, blah, blah. Well, we, well, yes, we want to press charges. We can't re- we can't replace any of those records. And the guy was like, OK, well, someone's going to have to come downtown and testify against him. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm the only fucking sap standing oh. there. And the district manager turns to me <laughs> and goes, Jeremy, yeah. it's, up to you. Uh, it's, oh, the, it's the movie where, like, you know, <laughs> there's three people in a shot. And it's like, well, I can't do it. Well, somebody has to go. <laughs> and then it cuts to the other guy going, what? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and then sh- the next scene, they're at the court. <laughs> so I get in my car. Now, I had. I've never been sitting in the stands of a court case. I've never done that, mm. let alone night court. I am familiar with the TV sitcom mm-hmm. Night Court from my youth. Yeah, and, and all the antics it and was hijinks. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot like real life mm-hmm. because there were some real shitheads in yeah. that court waiting to be arraigned. Um, there was everything from drunken, belligerent behavior, vandalism, car accident. Drunk driving. Every single person paraded through here was a fuck up because, of course, they were all arrested at like two in the morning mm-hmm. yeah. on a Friday night. So you're not you're not dealing with the smartest of society at this point. And there's it's not a judge. It was like a county commissioner 
was playing the role of judge. She's sitting behind this glass. There's this little glass booth to the right of her that's glassed in on all sides. That's where they keep bringing all the arrested people Mm -hmm. in. And one by one, us dipshits in the audience get up and go in front of the commissioner and give our story. And then, like one guy was screaming in there, like you know, from a movie, like <laughs> okay, yeah, oh my god, it was like Jai Courtney and Suicide Squad, yeah, yeah. And so it gets to me, and you know, they bring this guy out. He's still drunk, right? And he's like slopping around. She calls me up and says, "Okay, what happened?" And I, I'm telling her the story, and I give her the short version. You know, he was asleep in one of our movie theaters. Uh, we tried to wake him up. He saw us and ran. And then we found him peeing on our records. And she said, "What?" <laughs> doing what and i said i thought maybe i'm not like phrasing it in the proper court <laughs> legalese and i was like he was urinating man. <laughs> <laughs> and from behind me every single person just starts losing it because it's the funniest fucking thing you've ever heard we're all delirious with sleep at this point because it's like three in the morning by the time i get up there uh, and I never knew what happened after that, but that was my only time <laughs> testifying against somebody in court for urination. Clarification, Your Honor. Yeah, exactly. It was you. I don't know if I if I was uh, saying this properly, but um, <laughs> it's like have said pee. It's like it's like in the Big Lebowski where where uh, Jeffrey Lebowski is like every time a rug is to be mitterated upon. <laughs> 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 oh shit um okay so i have basically a two-parter i'm gonna say part one so part one of this is the the dumbest week ever at hollywood 27 mm-hmm. yeah hollywood 27 coming back into <laughs> the into the into the fray here uh harry potter and the deathly hallows part two came out july of 2011 mm-hmm uh, for the entire year, and maybe even before the before 2010 was over, we were being told you're going to be converted fully to digital, and it'll be you know you'll be completely digital, and not have to worry about it and everything. And I was like, man, I hope they do it on the day that they say that they're doing it because that's like February, and nobody gives a shit about what happens in February. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to care about, you know, bullshit warm bodies or whatever, like, (laughs) you know, if they can't get to see it or whatever. But um, so, like, obviously, and I and because I'm cynical enough, I knew that the first time they pushed it back, I was like, they're going to find the worst fucking week to put this put to give us digital conversion they're going to i know they are they moved it to april and like okay we're still not right in the summer yet yeah then they moved it to may i think and it's like well yeah <laughs> it's still not good but but uh but then and finally they decided we're gonna do it the week of harry potter and the deathly hallows part two jesus um so uh the the biggest a uh, problem with a full digital conversion, especially one of 27 auditoriums. And I think at the time we had six digital auditoriums at the time. Uh, so they were going to convert 21 of these things all in a week, basically. Jesus. And it's basically our technician and a whole bunch of other technicians come in. They wheel these things in, wheel the old ones out. And then, you know, that's, I guess they, I mean, they did a really fine job of doing that because <laughs> it was up. They were all up. Uh, but they, you know, it's like every day you come in, there's like, you know, oh, there's three new ones. Oh, and then there's another three and then there's another one and whatever. Um, now the, the thing that they told us about digital projection right off the bat was you have to change the, the lamps out of these projectors as soon as they hit their hours. Mm. Uh, when you're in 35 millimeter, you can fudge it a lot of times, uh, because, it, you know, it'd say, oh, this is supposed to last for 3,000 hours. And then, like, it's at 4,000 hours. And you're like, well, still looks good or whatever. <laughs> you're That's not professional at all. But yeah. it's what you would get by with because a lot of times you couldn't order stuff. They right. had It's a lot of stuff they're like, we're not going to spend money on. Oh, you get shut down by management? Yeah. I mean, you could order... You could order a couple, mm-hmm. um, but you couldn't order like what you needed. You couldn't order like, okay, if these two go out, I can't get the next two to back that up at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah, so, I even had to borrow a lamp from another theater once. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah because yeah. they don't let you keep in stock enough to, to replace anything. I mean, you have a bad day. 
you're yeah. gonna you're gonna have one down because you don't have enough to replace them. That's messed up. Yeah, and they and, and it's, counters, it's it's well, it's yeah. one of those things. If it's not making the money, yeah. then it's losing the money. Mm. And you know, the lamps were not an important thing, and so I I treated it as such. Yeah. So like, if it it would have to be kind of badly flickering, unfortunately, and there's some sun, there's some people who were watching some shows where they you know they saw some some shadows creeping in on the screen and everything. It's like, well, you know, so <laughs> sorry, what I had to deal with. Um, but uh, but so with the digital though, they were very adamant. You have to change it, and these were these digital ones don't last very long. They're a thousand hours. It's about three months, um, and. Well, I mean, it depends on, of course, the wattage and everything like that. The one that I was going to change on the week that we got Harry Potter and everything, uh, I think you could go to maybe 15 or 2,000, something like that. It wasn't much more over Mm. 1,000. But um, on the Wednesday of Harry Potter, the problem problem with uh, getting this new digital technology, and I had discussed this before when we talked about how digital works Mm -hmm. and everything, you it's easy to just plug in your movie and tell the computer, send that movie to everything. And the problem though, is when you're converting is that the, like everything that your TMS is involved with and everything, it has to know that projectors there. Mm -hmm. They don't do that right away. They have to, they have like a waiting period for when the, when the TMS discovers these new projectors Mm -hmm. basically. So, I couldn't just put Harry Potter in a in there and and send it to everything because the TMS was like, well, I know you got one in this one, and I know you got one here, and maybe one there, but the ones the other ones mm, don't know anything about them. Huh. Uh, so that means you have to go to each individual projector yeah. with this drive Jesus. and like plug it in have it download and it takes two or three hours and then you have to go to the next one and plug that in and so on. Now it's like Wednesday or Tuesday or whatever it is. And I'm there at night and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to start on this shit. I'm going to be here for a long time tonight. It's been a really long time and I'll get the rest of them tomorrow. But see, we had midnight shows on Thursday night or whatever it was. It might've been like an earlier week one. Uh, We had midnight shows in every auditorium. 27 auditorium oh yeah every single one of them now it was easy enough to get the ones that we already had and it was easy enough to get like the i think we got the they had the big ones uh right 15 16 and 17 the one that jeremy was actually just talking about a minute ago we had those all set up so there was like nine projectors you already had it on there so it still meant 18 Mm -hmm. and you could and like during my shift i got you know maybe three or four done or whatever and so you get you start whittling it down but when you stay late at a theater and you do all this type of stuff, all sorts of other stuff starts gathering your attention, especially since you're sitting there waiting for something for two hours. Yeah. You have to just find ways to do other things. And uh, and unfortunately, this one projector in number four was blinking a red light telling me, hours are up, you're going to have to change this lamp. I'm like, well, okay, I'll change it because, hell, I mean... Might as well. I'm sitting here, going to be here till probably like five o'clock in the morning anyway. Yeah. Um, so they're adamant about changing them because if the lamp were to explode after the hours were were over, uh, and it damaged the projector in any way, then they would be Regal would be uh, liable for those projectors, and those projectors cost like a million or whatever yeah. they cost or whatever. So. So they were very adamant, like, you know, do it. Now, in my logical mind, I realized there's probably no fucking chance in hell these things are going to blow up the way they say they are. Right. So I could just say, fuck you, and just (laughs) not change this tonight, but I'm going to be here anyway. But the time that I found it, it was like two or three in the morning, so Mm -hmm. it was just like, ugh, I really just don't (laughs) want to do this, but I'm going to be here anyway, so I'll go ahead and do it. Um now the this one had been installed maybe three months prior and whenever they installed these new ones whoever put the lamps in good god they put the bolts in like just super hard like like you could not turn it at all you were just like oh just put all your might into that thing and it just wouldn't move and i'm like it doesn't have to be that tight (laughs) (laughs) what is your problem um now there there was there's some other obstacles around this bolt that i have to turn um and notably like a little thing that acts 
looks like a blade basically if you if you were to just look at it i mean it's 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 a stopper for another thing that mm. you have to you have to take out this thing it's the lamp house and the lamp house stops on that thing and that bolt is right next to it and i'm straining very very hard to get this bolt and i'm like i'm looking at it, that thing and i'm like i really don't want my hand to go <laughs> into that thing i really don't want it to <laughs> and i was like when, there's no way to get this but to really give it a good go though uh. and i gave it a good go my hand went into this thing oh and 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 you, i don't know if you guys bleed the way i do <laughs> <laughs> um but sometimes on something like that you look down and you're like oh that's not that bad mm. and I, I can see a cut there or whatever not a big deal I looked down and I was like, oh, that's a little bit of a cut. And then all of a sudden, it's just like blood just <laughs> spurting out like a freaking stream. Jesus. And and like, I haven't finished changing this bulb, by the way. I'm sitting there just kind of going, blood, task at hand, blood. And then I'm like, I was like, I didn't probably need to get some help for this. I was really kind of in shock. Now. I'm, I'm, I don't have anything to cover this blood either. I'm walking up this booth from a very far reaches of the booth, bleeding on the entire floor as oh I go like to the, to the door that leads out of the booth. And I like open the door and I leave like a crime scene there. <laughs> and then I go like, I'm like, I got to go down to concessions and get napkins. So I'm bleeding all over concessions and like I get the, I get the napkin and I like put it on there and it's like it's like it's bleeding through pretty quick and, uh i'm gonna call 911 so i called 911 and i told them and you know what here is, fuck this shit you cannot tell a 911 person what you are doing at a movie theater that is the most imp- telling this story i'm leaving out a lot of details yeah. because it's there's a lot of just bullshit that i can't describe yeah, they can't yeah. accurately describe and I'm sitting there going, yeah, and you're, it's like two or three in the morning and you're like, I'm at the theater, Hollywood 27. I, uh, my hand is sliced open, uh, and I just, uh, don't know what to do. Just, uh, send an ambulance, whatever. And they're like, you're where you're what? No, you, you know, cause the dispatcher has to go through all their damn questions yeah. and everything. And it's just more annoying than anything. And like, Halle Berry's just trying to protect your life, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and they said, yeah, yeah, just you know, make sure you have something over it. Ambulance is coming and all that. The other thing, problem thing problem with Hollywood Twenty Seven is the address oh, is on yeah. Thompson Lane. But really, how you get in is another road. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. don't go on Thompson Lane because you got to go through the entire mall to do it. Look for the garish yeah. uh, well, Art Deco well, theater. Well, have you ever been to the Hollywood Twenty Seven before, <laughs> fellow Nashville? Are you local? go to that? <laughs> <laughs> They're fucking ambulance drivers. They should know what the fuck. Yeah, Hollywood exactly. Is. Come on. But like, so yeah. In the middle of all that, this isn't real. This is more of a postscript to the story. That's the story, really. <laughs> but while I'm waiting for the ambulance, a guy who works with me called at like three o'clock, knowing that I was there because uh-huh. I because once everybody else left, they said Chris just went off and did all this other stuff. Uh, he calls me to basically ask, "Do I need any help?" <laughs> and uh, and I was like. It's funny that you should call right now. I, my hand is completely bleeding all over the place. And he ended up taking me to the hospital, so I didn't call. I didn't, I didn't pay that ambulance fee or whatever. Uh, nice, but, nice. Um, but yeah, man, they had they they uh they stitched it up and everything. I've got this uh, scar that uh, remains today. <laughs> And everything. Is there still blood inside that projector? I'm sure there is. That's awesome. Like, uh, there's, oh, I mean, maybe not. I don't know. Chris I mean, has left his DNA up in that projection I, 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 booth I, 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 in I more kinda, ways than you know. That's right. All he of left it. Some of it on the screen. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. What what DNA are you talking about? Well, all of it. If we're going to be frank, <laughs> those aren't gummy bears. That's on the right. Screen. <laughs> but like, yeah, I'm sure there is. I mean, like, I don't know how they would have been able to clean up every single unless they replace some parts out of there. <clears> I'm sure like, there's some. Parts parts in there like they really wanted to swab it after six years they could find it they're training new people and they're like what's that that's yeah. chris's blood yeah yeah the blood of the innocent yeah. you should spilled out so that you could perform this job you should you should know that by now um all right well, that was a good one all right go i on. don't i don't have any bleeding in my story although there was 
the moment where I thought I might bleed. Ooh. Ah. I'm going to cheat a little bit again. This is not a theater story per se, though it begins at a movie theater and is bookended at the front and the back with movie watching. Uh-huh. And it has my friend Josh again. Oh, nice. And so I'm going to use that as a tiny sinew of tie to our topic to tell this story mm-hmm. of the night Josh and I picked up some high school girls. <laughs> <laughs> when you were 30 <laughs> I, will, I will start the story by saying i was 19 <laughs> and we like, were... it reminds me sorry to interject no go for it it reminds me of that story steve martin tells at the oscars and he's like i remember putting my arm around little sally sue at my at my first movie or whatever i even remember the name of the movie the lion king <laughs> 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 um okay so uh, josh had come with me home for like a fall break or something um and we went out to see a movie couldn't even tell you what we what we saw um but i know we went to the applewood nine in anderson indiana mm-hmm. probably still there to this day oh yeah probably still my dna somewhere in that no, <laughs> so we came out after the movie and we were just standing in the parking lot talking i drive at the time i was driving this beat up 84 black chevy cavalier nice it was looked old and beat up at the time. This was long after 84. Um, <laughs> and there was this group of four girls that we had seen inside the lobby and you know at least noticed were cute. We weren't exactly talking about them or anything. And we see them drive by and they're kind of looking at us and smiling. And we like kind of smile and wave and they drive away. Now, you have to understand that. I'm not that guy who talks to girls. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I have one story in my life of asking a girl for a phone number and she turned out to be a lesbian. That's mm-hmm. sort of the guy I am. Mm-hmm. I, I, all my life, I've dated people I knew from work or in my circle of friends or from class. I never like go up to strangers and I don't like cat call like, mm-hmm. hey, baby. Yeah. But, you know, we were both single and had been for a long time. And it was pretty girls. And they came back around for another lap and drove right past us the same direction Mm. so clearly they're trying to flirt with us and they wave and go hey and we go hey and they they drive away i turn to josh and i go you think we should have said something to them (laughs) and he's like i think they liked us and i was like let's go after them oh no (laughs) and so it was one of those typical george do the opposite of your first inclination kind of like I, that real jeremy would never do this mm-hmm. but they'd passed us twice had yeah. a fairly good idea what their car looked like and they couldn't have gotten out of this shopping center parking lot yet so we hop in the car <laughs> <laughs> and tear off to the other end of the, of the complex we see them turning through you know, your basic stalking we follow them for a couple miles out of town <laughs> and we're on this country road and they stop <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> I opened my door and I said, we're not stalkers. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, matter. Jesus. No matter. They were into us. <laughs> we were a mile from one of their homes. They were having a sleepover. Follow us back. We'll watch a movie. They were, they wow. were not safe at all in their choices because right. had it not been Goofy Josh and I, it had been like, I don't know, Marky Mark from Fear. <laughs> it could have been an entirely different experience for them. So we go back to this house and this house is the closest thing I've ever seen any house look to a cliche hunter's lodge. It's all exposed wood. It's a log cabin house. There's taxidermy fucking everywhere. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And we settle in. There's two girls on the far couch, and then me and the girl that obviously liked me, and Josh and the girl that obviously liked Josh, and they put in Tombstone. Oh. Ah. We're watching, I think it was Tombstone. The one that you hate. I hate that movie. Yes. I think it was Tombstone. The one that Wyatt Earp is way better than. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, well, anyway. <laughs> the one with the inferior doc. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> These are none of the things that I've said. You guys <laughs> are twisting my words. Yes. That's why it's so fun. <laughs> so we're watching the movie, and Josh and his girl are kind of like kissing a little bit and whatnot. And, and uh, I should also probably tell you. <laughs> That I had a girlfriend at the time. I think I said earlier Ah. in the story I was single. That just wasn't true. (laughs) I had a girlfriend. So the girl next to me is kind of flirting with me a little bit. And then all of a sudden, dad comes downstairs. No. Holding a rifle. No. And within 
three minutes, he's back upstairs. Like what? We give off such a harmless vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Dad comes down with a, with a rifle to check on who these guys are his daughter's hanging with. And within three minutes, he's like, oh, those guys are no threat. I'm Man, like, oh, that guy just threw shade all I'm over you. I'm telling you, like, I went from scared to offended in, like, 30 Without seconds Without saying time. a word. I know. So eventually this girl convinces me to go into one of these other bedrooms with her and we get about i don't know 30 seconds from making out and i do the right thing uh-huh. and i say i'm sorry i can't do this i've got a girlfriend um i probably should have told <laughs> Damn you before you've got, now. If, you could, this time. <laughs> if you could if you could talk to your old your younger self and just grab him by the shirt and say you know especially because when i got back from this fall break i found out my girlfriend had cheated on yeah, me what? come oh. on that's the worst. That's literally the end of the story, That's by the way. Bullshit. Oh, my God. I did not do anything wrong other than some light stalking. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I did the right thing, and I still got screwed and got hosed. And then that poor girl called Josh for like six months. Oh, oh wow. Didn't really go well for anybody that night. <laughs> but wow. Anyway, it's a good story I like telling. It makes good me sound like God. a pervert. Wow. Wow. <laughs> they were all 17 or older. They were like seniors and shit. I don't want anybody getting... Plus, you know... Yeah, you were young. I was you were young. Enough. By not- the way, let's pull up the Transformers movie that this let- allows to be Listen, right. Yeah. Tra- oh, we've got the a- statutes on right. <laughs> we've got a laminated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's just uh, let's discuss with Mark Wahlberg for forty five <laughs> seconds why this is okay. By uh, the way, that killed me that you thought it was ten. minutes. Oh, I know. It feels like I ten just minutes. Feels that long because it's so yeah, inappropriate. Yeah, it feels like ten minutes because you're just like, come on, come on. Do we really? We're really going to cite statutes here? <laughs> How can we give the dad and the girl's boy? friends some tension i know make him a pedophile yeah, yeah. or at least borderline enough they have to talk about yeah it. borderline <laughs> enough that he's got his own you got another story for us i do all right it's on the same week actually so i've i have cut my hand oh and you're recently stitched up i'm stitched up i'm ready to go for actually the next day because that's how damn that's how uh rub some up, dirt on it man that's how fucked up i am <laughs> i was like nobody else can do this job and and literally at the time nobody else could because yeah. it was a lot of uh just i mean yeah plugging the thing up and putting it in the projector is one thing but then like actually making the the playlists where there's trailers and everything uh then like the uh, then i talked about how the keys like you have the the all the film companies need to know you have these new projectors and they start making keys for Mm. these things that was a big fucking like bunch of nonsense uh so the day of we have midnight harry potters and everything is sold out that's 27 auditoriums sold out for harry potter and the deathly hallows part two you played it in you played that movie in 27 indeed we did wow indeed we did that is fucked up yeah it's it's actually i mean not as impressive as a feat as interlocking the dark no, night no, 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 no. Uh, even though we did crazy. that on seven auditoriums but with with 35 millimeter yeah, and everything yeah. um so that there's a lot of those technical issues and i'm having to make phone calls and like tell them like look we got this projector blah 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 and they have to get all your information and all this other stuff um uh and then there's like, you know, there's just stuff that's just not quite working. But uh, on my end, I did get it to where all 27 auditoriums were operating with Harry Potter and ready to go for midnight. Now, that was probably a good three hours before the show. Oh, Jesus. wow. Yeah. <laughs> um that that's how i mean now if we if we if it came down to it we would have had to like give people passes for all that type of stuff and like look sorry the projector's not working blah 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 but blah. not on your watch not on my watch <laughs> um we gotta go get those guys <laughs> um you can see chris walking around like he's lost all this blood like all pale yeah <laughs> no sleep he's just plugging in stuff <laughs> i had to make my i gotta make this deadline <laughs> as god that's is right. my witness that's right all i look deathly pale <laughs> for the deathly hallows um but like so so yeah i kicked ass in that regard mm-hmm. uh, we had you know had all the movies on the projectors we had all the playlists we're ready to go uh, so now it's preparing like, all right, we got to make sure this is all all set and everything. Had another projectionist with me. If you were a general manager of a theater that's about to have 27 auditoriums sold out, uh, how would you uh, conduct the crowd business? Would you uh, allow uh, a, each when when each auditorium that is ready and available 
is open, you let those people in so that they can be in the auditorium? Mm -hmm. Or would you wait until midnight (laughs) to let all of those people in? No way. Yes. Oh, my God. This is the absolute worst managing I have ever seen. That must have been like a riot. Ever. Wow. Um, Now, luckily, I'm upstairs, so I don't have to deal with this. (laughs) So, so... I don't have any crazy people stories for you or anything, (laughs) but I just know this is what happened because, uh, a manager actually called me on his cell phone from downstairs and said, this motherfucker, (laughs) 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 he's letting everybody in at midnight, which means I don't know, roughly 5,000 people. I don't know how much it was. I I could do the quick math, but like, it's a lot. It's in the thousands of people. That's crazy. And they are all coming in at midnight. Now they're all not just going to the auditorium. They're oh, yeah. also going to the concession stand. That's yeah. the biggest problem. Yeah. They're going to the concession stand. That's millions of people now mm-hmm. going to the concession stand. And like now we're being told not to start the movies on time. Uh, we're having to wait. Oh and there's already like 15 to 20 minutes of the trailers and stuff on yeah. it. And I'm like sitting there going, well, uh, telling the manager like there's 15 to 20 minutes of trailer so do you want to start it earlier than you think or whatever but i'm sitting there thinking also that earlier than you think is going to be still pretty late because you've allowed everybody in at midnight now yes here's how he should have done it here i don't even have to have hindsight to tell you what would have happened on that bullshit i have foresight to tell you what's going to happen here you have to like each auditorium that comes out. If it's even if it's the smallest one, you just let those people go in and like have their concessions, and you keep everybody else back. And then as each one gets open, yeah, you just let them in. You trickle them in, and then by midnight, you're gonna have everybody in. Everybody's gonna be cool and everything. I am also certain. Here's the worst part of it. I am also certain that his actions led to one of the auditoriums not being able to play. Oh, no shit. So there was, uh, there were people who waited till 1245. That's when we finally started the movie. They were all waiting 45 minutes late for this movie. Now, uh, there was an auditorium that just would not, I couldn't get the the lamp to strike in it. Couldn't do it at all. Now what happens with digital is it's got a, a pre-show on it that, plays all these advertisements yeah. all the advertisements that you're you're used to so basically the projector is told at a certain time turn on the lamp play these ads and then at the end of it you know there's the regal entertainment group and it's ready and it, and it doesn't i don't think it does this i'm not sure if it does this anymore they would show the little two projectors in the left and right hand corner right. that would tell people i can press start on this now um when it was manual it was manual for a brief like a maybe six months or so mm-hmm. um but uh so what happened now is these pre-shows came on and like these things lasted for like 15 minutes and then just they turned off afterwards you Mm -hmm. know now i know that if a lamp is struck and it's been on and it and and it turns off and then you try to restrike it like Mm -hmm. very soon afterwards it will cause a problem and of course you know i don't think we knew uh really how much problem there was there would be luckily it was just one and it was a small auditorium Hmm. but like uh i think because of that we tried to strike a lamp that had just gone off and it just couldn't come back on we broke like well you know it it broke it wasn't really us plus the fact that they had just been installed this week yeah and everything and then like i'm sitting there like i'm trying to do everything i know i'm trying to shut off the projector let it sit there for five minutes turn it back on let it reboot all that trying to like i tried to take the lamp out put a new one in i tried to do a whole everything that you could to save this show one of the assistant managers by the way comes up and he's like is there any way that you're going to be able to get this and i said look I'm going to try one more thing. I don't think it's going to, I, I said, I, it has a chance of working, but it's, it, I'm no guarantees. He went down to that auditorium and told people it's going to be up. Oh, Son of a bitch. what? Yeah. Son and, of a bitch. and, and that's, uh, that's probably because of how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry like i was really good at this shit and i could usually get the projector up but it, but in this case 
uh, you were a victim of your own success. I was. <laughs> and so he went down there and he said, he just, oh, that's Chris. He's going to get that shit up. <laughs> no, no, I had no chance of getting it up. In fact, it required like a week uh, later. I think it was like uh, a part that had to come in. And like, uh, and, and so he told the, now I just sit there and I think, and these people were probably in the auditorium till like one fifteen. Oh, wow. Uh, I just sit there and I think about those people's days. <laughs> they have been ruined. Yep. Their entire week has been ruined. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, probably half of the people that night, they saw their movie and they forgot that they waited 45 minutes to yeah. even see the thing or whatever. And they were just happy that they got to see the conclusion of Harry Potter. But those people were scarred forever. Mm-hmm. The the just the <laughs> fact that you know well, they had to wait an hour and fifteen minutes, and then the movie didn't even get uh, to play. And they probably bought concessions. And stuff. I guarantee you that was one of those situations where they gave them double passes and their money back. <laughs> one of those type of things because yeah. that's so bad. Oh man. Anyway, that's awesome. What a disaster. <laughs> good stuff i love chaos <laughs> oh my god that was that was chaos i'm just all i can say is uh, i i'd like to uh, personally thank all the people who worked downstairs that night yeah so that i didn't have to <laughs> because i could just see your rage building oh uh, my down god see- i i have in the past yelled at gms <laughs> uh vehemently before and like to the point that other assistant managers have been like you need to cool it, man. You might get fired and everything. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm in that don't give a fuck mode. Yeah. And uh, if I had been down there, I think that would have happened. <laughs> because I did later on have a big, huge argument with that guy that nearly led to my firing. You get a uh, lot of, I mean, this is not a story I plan to tell. This is super quick. But there was a guy who came in after me um, and our concession stand where I had been a GM was a circle. Mm-hmm. And so all the lines came out like spokes on a wheel. Mm-hmm. And if the video games in the lobby were arranged correctly, you can cope with, you know, a good five, six, seven people in each line. Mm-hmm. And this guy apparently came in after me and wanted to put his stamp on things. And he wanted to create a serpentine roped off main oh, line wow. where what? each cashier would then call the next person in line to their s- s- station, mm-hmm. which sometimes would be on the other side where they actually have their back to this serpentine line. Yeah. Uh, and crazy. every time they finish a customer, they have to turn around and yell, no, it's me over here. You got to look through the popper glass. Like, it was a <laughs> fucked up idea. And like a week later, they went back to normal. Well, like the serpentine thing works, but not in that situation. Right, right no. exactly. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. That's just, that's just dumb. I like I, it. Works <laughs> at, just dumb. It works at the <laughs> bank, right? Yeah. I, that's yeah. good for me. Right. I don't want to get they're in the They're all facing line. you. They're in a the line. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, anyway, so GMs have, sometimes have some bad ideas that they think are awesome. Yeah. It's the way of the world. Yeah. Some of them only got there because somebody else got fired and they got promoted in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Is that's going to be it for theater stories? I think so. Right. For this edition. Yeah, I think that's it. I, I there might be enough to scrounge up for a five. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Every time I think there's not any, I think, oh yeah, remember that time. Uh, but uh, anyway, but yeah. yeah, you guys have what 25 years combined. Yeah, he's got way more than me. I had. Uh, I was 93 to 2013, so 20 years wow. uh, with some gaps here and there for doing other things and everything. But I essentially, had about 20 years, 10, 11 years. With wow. A little bit of a gap so he almost doubles me but combined we're over 30 years that's experience. crazy yeah you get some stories yeah man all right so uh part two of this uh extravaganza today <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be talking about best oscar years You're the best around. that's gold Jerry. gold thank you thank you this is a, a moment uh, of joy and i want to kiss everybody because you are the image of the joy the Oscars are coming up. Yeah, smack in the middle of Oscar in season. In fact, I believe by the time this gets recorded, the uh, nominations will have been announced mm-hmm. because there it's like the end of January. Yep. So, um, Barrett, you haven't had a chance to really talk much, so why don't you give me one of your best Oscar years? Well, we think about it because we always talk about we're doing this, you know, best of the years that we've been alive bit every week up until recently. And it brings up, you know, we almost always talk about like, you know, this movie was nominated. This was the list of the nominations and everything. And when we got to 2002, 2003, and we're talking about Chicago, uh, it really drove home how shitty that year was mm-hmm. just in general. You yeah. Know? And uh, the legs that Chicago got to win Best Picture and then Best Sporting Actress <sighs> and all that stuff and have all these nominations it was just very bizarre to me. Um, it's interesting when you think about like 
it's just a shitty year. Like it, it doesn't matter what you throw up there. It, it's just a shitty year. And then you think about the times where it was a terrific year and it's insane that they had to pick one out of this batch. So it got me thinking, looking at previous Oscar years and what would constitute maybe the best of all time. And I'm going way back to start what, what I'm talking 1942. about. 1942. Mm-hmm. Actually, 1939. Whoa. Oh, gone with the wind. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Wizard of, Wizard of Oz. 1939 had Wizard of Oz. It had Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah. It had Gone with the Wind, Wuthering Heights, Stagecoach, which is John yeah. Wayne's basically Jeez. thing. And that's insane. That's, that is insane. It's a yeah. tremendous amount of film history right there. And yeah. those were the only five movies released. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, well, uh, it's actually weird because you go back and you look at these lists and there were this orgy of movies for Best Picture until, what was it, 44 that they trimmed it down to five. Mm-hmm. And then they went up until 2009 where they started you know yeah you know, including stuff like uh, spooching all over <laughs> yeah started including <laughs> stupid shit exactly yeah. exactly so you know it, it, i think it's much better when it's winnowed down and everything but i mean just those those five alone would have constituted one of the greatest years in oscar history yeah so yeah, that's, that's fantastic yeah. you know what's uh, just to interject here the uh, gone with the wind i think has like 10 uncredited directors on it or something yeah, like that yeah, yeah. like back in the day that's what they victor fleming is the decredited director but yeah. then there's like nine other people like if you go to the imdb it and happened he, all the time yeah. yeah it's like this and this and this and this <laughs> yeah. and frank capper's in there somewhere right, right? yeah <laughs> somehow <laughs> all right what do you guys think all right well i i also went way back to 2015 oh yes. um which we just discussed on a recent podcast but we also were just dis- as we were discussing those movies in the best of the year we named almost every single one of these best actor nominated performances all right so you have eddie redmayne you have brian cranston from trumbo mm-hmm. matt damon from the martian fassbender and steve jobs where he's fantastic mm-hmm. and leo in the revenant yeah damn yeah when you look back on that year in 20 years i mean those are heavyweights mm-hmm. dicaprio Fastbender, Red Man, I'm sure will be up there. Damon, Matt Damon, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of people who love the book The Martian, wish they'd cast somebody besides Matt Damon because the book Martian is not buff and he's not like heartthrob handsome or mm. what have you, but. As a fan of both the book and the movie, he nails that performance mm-hmm. so much. Like he carries that movie. It's a very unique kind of actor that can keep you engaged in that kind of a setting for that long. Mm-hmm. So all these performances are powerful and awesome. And I just thought, wow, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's a that's yeah. a hell of a category too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that um, uh, DiCaprio was essentially favored in that uh, in that race. I mean, everybody was just like, all right, just go ahead and give him his Oscar already. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. But uh, to consider how many performances that are in that that group and they're all heavy hitters. I mm-hmm. mean, that's a really good category right there. Um, I'm going back to 1975, which was the first of the best of the years that we were alive. Yeah. Uh, and I believe we probably even discussed this, but the best picture race in 1975 was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which won. Barry Lyndon, which is probably not the best Kubrick, but I think if you ask most Kubrick, you know, like huge fans, mm-hmm. they're going to say, no, no, let me sit you down here because Barry Lyndon is amazing or yeah. whatever. And I liked it. It's just, it, you know, compared it's to everything a, else. Yeah, the rest of them. Uh, but then you have Dog Day Afternoon, you have Jaws, and you have Nashville. Yeah. Really consider all five of them to be solid to great. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you're going to have some people, especially around here who think Nashville is like, oh, come on. They're not, you know, it's not very uh, complimentary of Nashville or whatever. It's really more about America guys, not really yeah, Nashville. Yeah. It's about the movie. It's yeah, not about and the Nashville city. is a, uh, and that was the same way about Nashville. When I first watched it, when I was like 17, I was just like, oh, you know, they're so down on Nashville. Mm. But then you watch it later as a film buff and you're like, wow, this is a fucking great movie. Yeah. And in Jaws is unimpeachable and Dog mm-hmm. Day Afternoon is great. I didn't like that at first when I watched it way back in the day either. But really? Yeah, I was too young to watch it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, and then later on, you're like, yeah, yeah, this is really good yeah. stuff. All five of those are outstanding movies yeah wow well i'll i'll go back a year before that because this is fascinating man the mint the 74 75 76 era like all that is just incredible it's amazing uh because 1974 really uh intrigues me the best picture race was fantastic yeah you got you got uh, chinatown the conversation lenny the towering inferno yeah, and godfather, and godfather too. Two. so i mean that's just a murderer's row but mm. what what really got me was the two actor races, the best actor and best supporting actor, 
And I'll read to you. It's a best actor. It was Art Carney winning. Yes. Uh, for Harry and Tonto. I, like you, have never seen that. Right. right. Nope. Uh, <clears throat> but then the rest but of it is. This is the killer. Yeah. He he beat out four legends. Now, Art Carney is a legend in, in his own way. Yeah. With being in the Honeymooners and all that. But. Uh, he beat out four unbelievable legends. For he this. beat out Albert Finney, who was doing Hercule Poirot in yes, Murder on the Orient. He's Express. amazing in yes, it. Yes, he is. Dustin Hoffman and Lenny, who is ridiculously good. Like yes, that's he is. just one of those you're just mesmerized. Yes. That's Dustin Hoffman at his best. Absolutely. Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. Yes, he is. He's fucking Jake. Yeah. And then Al Pacino is Michael Corleone. Yeah. Uh, in The Godfather Part Two. Yeah. That is insane. That is ridiculous. I mean, it's insane that he, wa- I mean, I'm sure his performance is wonderful, but I mean, that's just a huge lineup. You wonder on something like that, was there a true, like a lot of times when people bring this up, I'm like, eh, maybe, um, that there was a true, uh, like people were voting for so many of the other actors that the other actor got elevated by because of it and there was a you know i'm sure that there were also some people who were doing the sentimental thing because art carney had been in the honeymooners yeah. and everything like that um that that they were they elevated him to the winning okay I mean, who talks about harry and tonto now exactly those four other movies you talk about all the time but the, the yeah. <laughs> this one <laughs> well the even crazier thing i think you're you're definitely on to something because out of the five nominees for best supporting actor three of them we're from Godfather Part Two. Yeah, Jesus. yeah. <laughs> you had Robert De Niro who won for Young Vito Corleone, and then you had the um, uh, Michael Gaz- Gazzo. He was Frankie Pentangeli, Frank Pentangeli, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, Lee Strasberg, yeah. who was Hyman Roth, yeah. and then you had fucking Jeff Bridges, <laughs> right, <laughs> for the best supporting actor, yeah, and Fred Astaire in The Towering Inferno. So well, I mean, this is just a crazy year. Yeah, and it's and it's almost kind of I mean it's almost crazy that De Niro won considering all the other competition from godfather 2 yeah. he has in there and lee strasberg is one of those guys that everybody considers a legend yeah. in some way and it's like and that hyman roth character yeah. was, was indelible oh and yeah potentially i mean man that's a great like nuanced performance mm-hmm. you know yeah uh anyway those are that boggled my mind to be like in movie into movies in 1974 must have been just heaven yeah i would imagine so i mean i was in my dad's ball sack. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. You may not have been. Until not in 1974. Forever? <laughs> that would have been like six years of hanging out in your well dad's ball sack. before you were born. <laughs> Probably had some moments between the, that year. And yeah. <laughs> like a bunch of your brothers and sisters like went before you. Um, <laughs> went before you. <laughs> uh, All right. What else? All right. Uh, I was mostly looking for categories that would be tough for me to pick today uh, where the competition was that fierce. And so I'm going to go to 1995 with the best original screenplay. Uh-huh. We'll get Uh-oh. we'll get Nixon out of the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some people love Nixon. Yeah. I could take or leave Nixon. Yeah. Does it have a good screenplay? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then the other four, Mighty Aphrodite, Toy Story, Braveheart. And Usual Suspects. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. That's a pretty good and year for Usual Suspects story. won it. Yeah. 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 Um, that is a pretty hard hitting, uh, category. Right I mean, there. I love Mighty Aphrodite. I know you're a Woody Allen oh, fan. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you feel about that. Movie. I love that. It's really the whole Greek chorus. Like, yeah. Those, those are the cool things. Do. Whenever Woody Allen does something like that, yeah. it always gets my attention because his movies are almost always like the baseline is like 60%, mm-hmm. you know? And then if he can throw in like a diversion or something that elevates it, like can't Kate Blanchett's performance in Blue Jasmine. That something that takes it up a notch, like it'll easily soar into like 80, 90, 100, you know? Yeah. 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 I anyway. Think, I think Woody Allen has been nominated uh, more than 10 times for screenplay. Oh, wow, um, yeah. I think it. I think it's something like in, it might be like 13 or 14 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I can it's, see it. It's, it's, it's quite a bit. Yeah. Like, uh, they don't get, often get him as director, but he's been nominated as director several times too. But uh, his screenplay is almost like anytime it's good, it gets nominated. Yeah. It's like the Meryl Streep of yeah. screenplays. <laughs> He well, also has won as many uh, MTV Best Kiss Awards as Toby Maguire. Mm-hmm. Did he win an MTV Movie Award? No, it was a joke. <laughs> <with> the <laughs> Be- because the MTV Music it's- the MTV Movie Awards are so illegitimate <laughs> that we could believe that Woody Allen <laughs> has totally probably won. <laughs> he yeah. has been in movies with like hot 
yeah, kids the younger generation loves. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. In Manhattan, I mean, she was 15. She was only 15. <laughs> This is um, one of the perviest podcasts ever. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, okay, let's get some women in this. <laughs> uh, okay, 1995 again. Uh, Susan Sarandon won for Dead Man Walking. Good movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good movie. Now, she was up against Elizabeth Shue for Leaving Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, and now... This is the one that you're going to be like, why did you pick this category? Sharon Stone for Casino got nominated. Oh, yeah. And this is a great performance it for is, Sharon it is. Stone. But like you normally you'd be like, Sharon Stone, nah, that's not quite a heavy hitter. But you have Meryl Streep, all, as always, for Bridges of Madison County is in this. And you have Emma Thompson for Sense and Sensibility. Those By the way, all- side note, to inter- no, I'm sorry to interrupt. The girlfriend that cheated on me while I was not making out with the girl in that theater store, mm-hmm. we, we ended up staying together before she cheated on me again but um we had planned a trip to go home and in the two months of us trying to make our relationship work we went home to my house she met my parents and then we watched bridges of madison county which neither one of us knew was going to be basically about adultery (laughs) and it was the most awkward weekend of my life and then she cheated on me again we broke up after that wow man don't don't if somebody cheats on you my personal advice they're probably gonna do it again. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> but I think the I think possibly the stronger strongest actress category was two thousand eight. Um Kate Winslet won for the reader. Yeah. Then you have Anne Hathaway for Rachel Getting Married, Angelina Jolie for Changeling, which is a great movie. Melissa Leo for Frozen River, wow. and Mer- Meryl Streep again for Doubt because Meryl Streep is yeah. the Woody Allen screenplay. She's also awesome Boston. in Doubt, though. She's she great is. in that movie. She is, and, and like a lot of times, you see her get nominated, and you're like, you just wanted to nominate Meryl Streep, <laughs> didn't you? You just wanted to find a way to get her into this or whatever. But in Doubt, yes, she's very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a very strong category. Yeah, yeah. Good one. I've got a best and worst in the same year. Go for it. The predicate of this whole conversation was the 2002 awards. Mm. And that was when Chicago won for best picture. And that was some bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in that year, so this is shitty for best picture nominations. Chicago. Now, I liked Gangs of, Gangs of New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think it was terrific or anything like that. But uh, The Hours, which sucks. Um, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers is, is good, but it's not really typically like the, the, the Oscar fair. Uh, until the next year. Uh, and then The Pianist. Mm-hmm. So these are not like strong world beater, you know, categories, especially the one that won. But the best supporting actor category in this year was fantastic. Mm-hmm. You had Chris Cooper that won for Adaptation. Yep. Mm-hmm. He was dynamite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Crazy white man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you had Ed Harris in The Hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ed Harris' performance is great. Paul Newman in Road to Perdition. Yeah. Yes. You had John C. Riley, It was maybe the best thing about Chicago. Yep. yep. <laughs> the- <laughs> Mr. Cellophane. <laughs> Mr. Cellophane. And you had Christopher Walken in Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so that was a great category. Yeah. Great category oh, in the cool. I know it's so great, God bless but that is a strong one. That is a very strong one. That's mm. a you got some legends mixed in there with uh, you know the. I mean, they're all pretty. I mean, legendary. Yeah, I man. Guess. Chris Cooper. Uh, in- interestingly, the the best actor is, is a really strong group too because Adrian Brody won for the pianist. Mm-hmm. Nicholas Cage got nominated for adaptation. Michael Caine uh, for the Quiet American. Yeah. Daniel Day Lewis for Bob uh, Bob the Butcher. Yeah. It reminded me when you said that, it reminded me mostly of uh in uh Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back where Jay B- uh, Jason Biggs is like uh is like uh and of course uh Vanderbeek is playing Silent Bill. <laughs> 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 anyway, yeah, you had him, and then you had Jack Nicholson in a bad wow. shit. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Good crazy. Stuff. Good stuff. I only have one more, um, and mine is going to be, I wanted to do something with score, because I'm such a music yeah. guy, yeah, yeah. and so I went back to 2007, oh, where yeah. we have, um, now, The Kite Runner, which I think I saw once, and I don't remember the score, mm. but the other four, Atonement, which I think is the one that won. 310 to Yuma, which if you watch that movie the first time, you're paying so much attention to the acting, mm-hmm. you don't listen to the score. But when you've seen it a few times, the score really stands out. Uh, Michael Clayton, yeah. which has oh, a phenomenal yeah. score. And then Ratatouille. Yeah. And now, that was, I would have a hard time picking which one of those I wanted to put in right now. 
Was that Jakina that did? Yeah, Jakina did Ratatouille. Oh man, and that's, that's another awesome. great score. That is a great score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you have all the like Parisian elements and everything yeah. like that that yeah. puts in there. Um, yeah, there's a there's quite a few others. I mean, I think we could probably go through a lot of these years. Yeah. But uh, I'm I guess I'll go with uh two the 2010 one. This is an interesting one for me, and this is something that when you're looking at great years and great categories and all that. Happens surprisingly often. And you were talking about Art Kearney earlier winning against all those four big, huge legends. In 2010, Tom Hooper won for the King's Speech yeah. for his, his uh, best director nod. Uh, he had to beat out Darren Aronofsky for Black Swan. Yep. Uh, the Coens for True Grit. Yep. David Fincher for The Social Network. And David O. Russell for The Fighter. God, Fuck 2010. How did Fuck he it. win? I know it's one of those things. the The other thing that you notice about Oscars is that this is the thing that bothers me. Like you go through and look at all the winners and the nominees and everything, and you're like, "That's a movie that rode a crest wave, yeah. like for three weeks and got nominated, and then it disappeared from everybody's imaginations afterwards." There's like a lack of imagination with all this type of stuff. And The King's Speech is one of those movies, man. It's a good movie, but not like, oh my God, so great. Best movie I saw this year by far. I mean, it, it makes no sense. It makes and, me angry. Yeah. When you look at King's Speech, what do you see in there that is just phenomenal as far as it's directing well, as, it as, is british especially as opposed to fucking inception yeah All which didn't even get nominated that. yeah well i got nominated for best picture yeah but christopher nolan didn't get nominated uh, the social network i mean david this yeah this movie makes me angry yeah. this is such bullshit yeah it's also so responsible much- for the most uncomfortable video i've ever made and back when we were doing supercuts, yeah, I made a supercut of all the times he stammers and stutters. Oh no! <laughs> and the video has no actual words being said, so it's literally like five minutes of. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and it's like nails on a chalkboard, hard yes. to watch, and I fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you see this a lot, like they just the. I, I think these a lot of these nominees, when you read like who was nominated in a certain year, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot that was nominated or whatever. They do that a lot, man. These movies get sort of a they campaign. Yeah, they they do all these dinners and all this other type of stuff to try. You know, they if you look at the trade magazines, they pull out these big, huge, like, you know, double page ads of, like we would like you to consider. Yeah. You know, Forrest Gump for best picture and like, you know, and all the you know, they do this stuff all the time. And like um, and if you know the right people, I think you just get into the right parties or whatever. And then suddenly you're a nominee and. And then, yeah, you look back five years later, and it's like, oh, man, really? That got nominated? Yep. Why? I even saw or one. Um, yeah. our recent and upcoming guest, Aaron Dicer, talking on Twitter about you know certain award season films. I think Silence was the one he was talking about that he just didn't get a screener for mm-hmm. because that studio decided not to send him out. Um, and like that can impact whether or not a movie is going to build buzz amongst critics if none of them can see it because there's only playing in one market or something yeah. right aaron's in missouri so if they don't send him a screener he's not going to be having buzz for that movie mm. um and you're right that they put ads out what what if you buy better maybe king's speech just bought the best ads i don't know yeah i don't well and it plus it got that sort of that it rode that wave of like it got caught in the public consciousness i don't know if there was some oprah winfrey type stuff going i I talk about i talk about the the oprah winfrey circuit basically (laughs) like it you get the actors on oprah winfrey and you get all these like you know uh like moms and dads going yeah that king speech that's all right you know you get a a wave of popularity i keep saying wave but you get this popularity uh from all this you know this sort of like well the common mom loves this movie and the common dad and then suddenly it gets that now and then when it wins you're like you know oh yay we won for king's speech and then a year later you're like looking back at the annals of film history (laughs) king's speech should not have won best picture that year oh Um, man by the way i ran another i ran across another kind of interesting thing uh and this has nothing to do with best years or anything but um the best director um over the past six years not one american has won 
Interesting. Tom Hooper uh, won for King's Speech. Then you have, uh, you know, the name I'm never going to be able to pronounce for the artist. His name is Michelle Hazanavicius. Something like that. <laughs> I he thought won. it was a good stab at it. Hazan uh, Yeah. Yeah. It might even be a chis at the end, not a cis. Uh, Ang Lee uh, won for Life of Pi. Another I'll, hard name to pronounce. Yeah, very hard. Very. I hard. was calling him Ong for the longest time. I know. I was, uh, yeah. And then you have Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity, and then you have Alejandro G. Iñárritu, who won the last two yeah. Oscars. So the past six have been uh, not American. Huh. Mm-hmm. USA. Yeah. USA. Yeah. Let's USA. let's make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm cringing along with you. Do you want to move into questions? Sure. Let's do it. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. You said you had a surprise question. I do. Uh, because we've been talking about ourselves uh, today and theater stories and things like that, an interesting question on SoundCloud today came in and said, what inspired you guys to do this podcast and what podcast do you like listening to? And I thought that was interesting because as I think about how did we decide to do this podcast? I remember. How was it? Barrett said, you guys really need to be doing a podcast, <laughs> and if I volunteer to help get it set up and do all the work, and we figure out a way to make that work, would you guys be willing to try it? And I believe I emailed you back, as long as I don't have to do anything but show up, talk, and leave, <laughs> I'm in. And the first couple of weeks were an experiment, it worked, and here we are. Yep. <laughs> That's and how I remember the story. And I was I exactly so, yeah. the same way. I remember <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the saying this in the way of the Annie Hall question, where there he's like, he's like, how are you two do it how do you stay together and, he, and she's like i'm uh i'm a little dense and i don't have any good ideas and uh, <laughs> and, I, uh, <laughs> and uh i'm kind of vacant or blah 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 and he turns to the guy and he goes and i'm exactly the same way <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i'm exactly the same way because you know what we do as far as cinema sins we're a bunch of idiots doing this stuff on youtube and everything but it takes a lot of our time uh it takes a lot of time so like in in order to do a podcast we would need somebody like barrett to Mm. come in and be like all right i'm editing this thing and i'm gonna send it to you guys and Mm. blah 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 if it wasn't for that then we'd have you'd have to either hire outside help or something like that but um that you were so willing to uh do all this yes and let's take a moment and praise barrett because he has done all the research on all the audio gear all the testing on the studios Mm -hmm. all the finding the right software Mm -hmm. and all the edits of every podcast and if you guys like the Sincast, Barrett is basically responsible for. i will say this i think i have a sneaking suspicion that this surprise question Barrett already knew the answer to. He so just that he, wanted us he to just wanted him. us to no, praise him with adulation. I was just about to say that that, that yeah. was not the, right. <laughs> the reason that I asked this question. The the reason that that it kind of tickled my memory was that you know because the only persona that you guys had at the time was this cinema sense right. character, mm-hmm. and you know you'd get a lot of flack for like, oh, you guys hate movies. That's some bullshit. Like mm-hmm. you don't like any of this shit. You're just nitpicking, right? And knowing the way you guys the way that i do i know that you love movies mm-hmm. and this was a good outlet to kind of get that across yeah, in a in more hindsight, honest way that's what i would say it, mm. it, g- it gave us an opportunity to discuss movies in a way that shows our genuine appreciation for them and our real personalities now i think we always thought that would be more obvious in the videos yeah. than it ultimately turned out to be and i think there are a great many of our fans that have known from the beginning that we love movies mm-hmm. uh if only for the audio outtakes that we do yeah. that i think show we've at least seen a shit ton of movies but um but i looking back i'm really glad to have this outlet because i've seen plenty of comments on twitter and the subreddit of people who are like hey i didn't know this about you or that about you and now um now I realize you love movies. I think, you know, another reason behind it for me, I think I remember talking about it openly, was to make you more of a personality in the brand. Mm. That's why we started rolling you into the new movie recipes, um, both because I think there's something special with the dynamic of three as mm-hmm. opposed to two. You get a lot more gaps in conversation and talk with just two people, mm. a lot more lulls. You add a third person and exponentially the opportunities and the inspirations, the ideas go up. But... uh Oh, I lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> that'll, that'll do, pig. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, that's exactly right. I think that's all. I think that's the reason why we ended up doing it. And and you know, it's I I enjoy the the um, ability to be able to talk about movies in in the way that 
we all talk about movies. Mm, you know, yeah. this other this other way is a, a way that we've come up with to be dicks and try to be funny and all this other type of stuff and uh, to varying degrees of success and everything. But um, but I enjoy I enjoy talking about the stuff the way you know movies are supposed to be talked well, about, yeah. quote unquote. Because we we literally talk like this in real life. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the other thing, other. right? Is that it's just it's good for us. It's good therapy for me. This is what we would do if we were getting together at the bar to have a few yeah. beers. It wouldn't be this structured. But the kinds of things we say, inappropriate and not, <laughs> that's exactly the way we would talk about movies in general. I think. It's real important that we knew you and were friends with you already. I think if yeah. you were just a guy we'd hired, it would have been a lot harder to get that chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, but yeah. that was that was a good question. Yeah. yeah. And Barrett is responsible, and so shower Barrett with praise yeah. and BJ's. Mm-hmm. And Johnny right. Barrett's that, that you lick and That's stick right. to his screen. Mm-hmm. Well, that I could get into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Barrett, Barrett has big screen. He this- has a very, very big screen. <laughs> you know what they say about Rule 43. <laughs> if it exists there's porn of it yeah <laughs> so there yeah. you go okay so what are some examples of films that you like from genres that you don't usually go for mm, okay so i hate romantic comedies yeah uh the reason why is not because they are inherently bad it's because most romantic comedies have this premise the the beautiful guy and the beautiful girl uh don't know each other they run into each other they hate each other so they hate each other then guy or girl does something that endear usually it's the guy Mm -hmm. usually it's something involving kids Mm -hmm. or something like that where it endears him to the girl then they start dating they have uh, a wonderful romance then the guy has a secret or a dumbass thing that he does that breaks them up and then they spend the next 10 minutes worrying about it and then by the end of it the guy you know does his hitch thing like will smith does at the end of hitch (laughs) you know and and professes his love or he holds a stereo up or something (laughs) like that i'm not going to talk about say anything i wouldn't really put in that sort of category i think we can disqualify any cameron crow right because elizabeth town is exactly what he just described (laughs) yeah (laughs) but the two in that genre and i believe we voted both of them in Uh uh, annie hall and when harry met sally are above that now when harry met sally has some of that kind of they hate each other and then they get together and then Billy Crystal does something stupid and all that. Yeah. But the structure of that is it's a way funnier and wittier script than is ever given to romantic comedies. Uh, and it's got a different structure. It's a little bit more of a like jump in time and all this other type of stuff. And it's never you never sort of like watch that movie and you're sitting there going, I wonder if when they'll ever get together. They yeah. they seem so perfect for you. You don't think they seem so perfect for each other you glad that they're friends and that's it but you know that eventually they will Mm. it's just it's a different type of thing whereas in other romantic comedy it's like those two show up and you know all right they're well what's the bullshit that's gonna get them together annie hall is another completely different jumps around in time yeah and everything and it's it's more about uh a loving relationship that deteriorates yes. over time and uh that's why I, that's why i love that movie so much so those two are great all the mo- most other romantic comedies you know take them or leave them yeah annie hall has as much of her perspective as his yeah almost. you know they have those I think it's a split screen where they're, oh, it's they're the, the analyst and they're like, how often are you having sex? And he's like, <sighs> hardly ever, like three times a week. And she's like, Har- all the time, three times a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to, yeah. I mean, and then you see them, that scene at the end and uh, I don't want to spoil La La Land because that, that reminds me a lot of it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But that scene at the end and Annie Hall, man, where... They meet and at the theater and everything, and they're just kind of like, "How are you?" You know, they, this this almost awkward thing, but this familiarity, it just it makes it a beautiful story that is unlike any romantic comedy until maybe later on that yeah. you see. You know, I would say another one that breaks that mold is broadcast news. Yeah, I think of that as a romantic comedy because several people are pining for each other throughout mm-hmm. the course of this movie and. You kind of get two stories, both around Holly Hunter, one with Albert Brooks and one with William Hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I love that Albert Brooks moment when he tells her how much he cares about yeah. her. I was just watching this the other day. He sits down. He's like, oh, I got to not say that kind of stuff. Yeah. He takes everything out of me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he says, I wish that I could call up the girl who's my friend and tell her about the girl that I like so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And she's always just like, oh, honey. Yeah. Like, she's always condescending. And, <laughs> right. and of course, none of them end up together. They, It's very well, unconventional. It's, it's interesting. Like, if I were to ask you, like, if you hadn't seen broadcast news in a while, would you say Holly Hunter and William Hurt dated in the movie? Would you Would you say yes? They did. No, they yeah, never yeah. did. Never. They, they did. went to the correspondence dinner. One they time. never got to that point, and it and it feels like they yeah. did, but they never do. And it's, a, it's such an interesting movie on yeah. so many levels. I, I don't think we both of us can recommend that movie enough no, that's a good call it's though it's a good call though your hand your hands in the shot get your <laughs> hand out of the shot <laughs> um well i hate horror movies uh-huh. mm-hmm. i have almost all of my wa- movie watching life not seen the point in trying to scare myself and especially uh, as a child of the 80s there's just as much formula in horror movies as there is in romantic mm-hmm. comedy to the point where a movie like cabin in the woods is only good because all these movies that came before it that gave it the formula to skewer. Uh, but I'm going to make a bold confession today on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I really love D-level slasher horror movies. Really? <laughs> I'm talking like Wrong Turn 4. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, there's a movie playing right now on Stars called The Gallows. Got a bunch of nobodies in it. <laughs> and some kid had died in a play, hanging himself on the stage when it was supposed to be a prop noose. And that was 40 years ago. And somehow the schools decided to put that play on again. <laughs> like, that would, like that would ever happen. Right. And now the ghost of that kid is killing all the kids in the play. Of course. Um, I, I don't know why I like them, but the, I think part of the reason is they're usually so bad. Mm-hmm. I'm not ever scared. Yeah. And I don't like to be scared. That's I don't like haunted houses. I've never enjoyed being. It's not something I get a thrill out of. I realize the endorphins go up. Some mm. people get high off of that. I also don't eat. No, hot chicken. Well, there are just certain experiences I know are not for me. Um, there's usually really hot people in them. Yeah. But they don't have any baggage because they're no names. Like, <laughs> I haven't seen them from anything. So I'm not like, oh, it's that one girl who was the preppy in this movie. Like, I don't have any character baggage. Uh, the effects are usually pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't know what it's the same thing. I'm going to make another stupid confession. I love modern day shitty Hallmark and Lifetime movies. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like. Like I'm dating my neighbor's daughter. Uh, dot oh, com, wow. or you know, like they're all terrible. They crank that <laughs> shit out. I think one of my favorites is that one with Kaylee Kiyoko and uh, and Rob Lowe, where he's like playing uh, Peterson, the cop that killed oh, two of his wives, and. Um, it's not good, <laughs> but I have watched it like three times, and I don't know what it is, but it's just, it's. I guess it's like my, my version of my wife likes to watch like Teen Mom 2 or yeah. Sister Wives, and she doesn't respect any of those people. She watches it culturally because she enjoys their stupidity. It's um, interesting you bring up these type of movies. Now, I actively avoid watching Lifetime movies. Um uh, and maybe I should watch them just for that kind of kind of thing. But I remember uh, over the uh, over Christmas, uh, for some reason, the family turned on some sort of lifetime Christmas movie. Where now those I don't watch. <laughs> where the where the this it's like a hard work, working woman and and like uh, she uh, she's like a terrible person but then she runs into this elf that gives her like wishes and stuff and it's like uh, and 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 I, everybody like there every like 10 minutes or so someone would turn and go so why are we watching this again <laughs> and 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 uh, and it's like I, I was like I don't know I I didn't choose it and uh, and then and then like it got about 45 minutes in and it was like why are we still watching this it's like well we're invested now <laughs> we're gonna have to watch the rest of this right because we gotta know we gotta know the end of it and everything I don't even remember there's something about the draw of seeing how it ends that yeah. will make me watch an average movie longer than I should mm-hmm. if it's one that I've like never seen before like I was watching watching this movie called mr right earlier today it's got sam rockwell and um, yeah. anna kendrick in yeah it. have you seen this Mm-mm. i think uh max landis wrote it oh really huh. but uh he's like a hitman and they fall in love and start dating then she finds out he's a hitman but she also has the special like she can slow time down with her eyes and has quick hand-eye coordination or what have it's not a great movie mm-hmm. but it, and it, it's it's just engaging enough 
that I kept watching. Yeah. I kept watching, yeah. even though I was like, well, Bourne is better than this. And, you know, there's a lot of movies that are better than this. But I like these two people And, yeah, so you much. have two great actors there, two very appealing yeah. people. I mean, yeah, you're going to be drawn into some of those stupid mm. movies sometimes. I think it is kind of amazing that you like these D-level slashers, though. I think that is kind of funny. Um, I wish I knew why. Yeah, I... I and, and, and I'm a guy who... They're fun. I've seen every single Wrong Turn movie. <laughs> That's and not I can't, something you should I can't, say. I can't. I can I've seen the first one. Yeah, and um, that's all you should. The 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 thing is about um, horror movies is it's a it's a genre that I love. Like I love horror, but there are so few good ones that get mm. through. Like like how did I get to the point of liking horror when I don't like very many of the ones that come the out? The good ones were when you were young. Halloween. Yeah, I guess so. Friday the Thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street, the classics. Well, the good ones had a mood I mean, because I, I think I, Jeremy and I are the same. I don't like horror either just for the sake of, you know, it, people watch it all differently. The guys from Modern Horrors uh, watch it just, you know, to see how they did, how they pulled off effects sure. and that kind of thing, how they set the mood, how they tell the story and all that stuff. I just, it, it doesn't really amuse me to see 10 different ways for a guy's head to get chopped off or something like that. Uh, unless it's something like Deathgasm because that movie fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> I but saw Dev Guzzum, by the way. It was fucking awesome. It was phenomenal. It? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the ones that set the mood, like The Shining, mm -hmm. is a horror movie that I love. It it has never really scared me. Uh, the only shot that scares me is the weird down the hall shot with the dude getting a blowjob from the bear. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. scares you more than the blood coming. Yeah. Well, and Blood always well, and out. Kubrick uh, did. There's two cam. There's a camera angle. He's done this twice at least. The one the where that's underneath uh, Jack as he's like sl like hitting mm -hmm. the door mm -hmm. and everything. He's in that freezer or whatever. Yeah, he's looking and, down. Yep. And yeah, and, and and he they did it another time in um, A Clockwork Orange uh -huh. when the guy in the wheelchair hears it singing in the rain yeah. and he's got that like yeah. that. The, you're not expecting the angle at all <laughs> yeah. it's like whoa what that's freaky as shit yeah. but uh but yeah kubrick just has a way about it's, doing stuff yeah everything is atmospheric another one is alien yeah that, uh, is ostensibly a horror movie uh but and yes there are plenty of scares in there and everything but it's not about that it's about all the moments that lead up to it it's about all of the you know, the world that they make, mm -hmm. uh, the world. And it's interesting. They're both kind of in an isolated environment. One's in a spaceship, one's in the Overlook Hotel. And that's the kind of horror that I can get behind. Yeah. Uh, something that takes a perspective, that chooses a side, basically, rather than just throwing up like some in between the D-level slasher flicks and, you know, this supreme stuff, you know, the things that are supposed to be good, the Conjuring 2 and things like that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd rather watch something that really puts its brain into it. It's yes. the best Latin I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> How would you even know it was Latin? That's best correct. Latin All right, next question. There was a question about Andy Serkis and if there were any contenders for an Oscar that were outside of the major categories. Mm -hmm. um, well, I will say, I think Andy Serkis will get a, an Oscar for Lifetime Achievement or something like that later. Now, who else out there it could possibly do it? Right now, it's hard to really uh, figure out who might deserve an honorary Oscar down because, uh, unfortunately, we aren't told who the great stuntmen are yeah. or the great, you know, whatever it is that we like about movies that don't get awards or whatever. But one one name did cross my mind on this question. And that is, I'm going now. It's it, I think it looks like y Yun Wu Ping, but it's really I think apparently supposed to be Wan He Ping. Oh, the guy that did the choreography for the Matrix. He did, mm -hmm. and he did the wire foo and all this other type of stuff. And then, of course, a million movies copied it afterwards. Uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, all that. Yeah. Although he may have done it before the Matrix. Um, I'm probably being ignorant of that, but, um, but uh, a guy who. Uh, did that kind of work and it's basically getting down to stunts and mm -hmm. everything it's stor stunt choreography yeah is uh but you know they have i was looking this up today there, it was they've been trying for decades to try to get stunts uh awarded in hollywood and they just not not doing it um i mean what would that that would be an exciting category though can you imagine you're watching the broadcast 
And then they're like, you know, here's the best stunts. And you see Tom Cruise hanging on the side of a fucking... I was going to say, Tom makes... Cruise would probably beat whatever <laughs> stuntman got well, nominated. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then you see, like, the actual stunt guys doing their thing. I guess what they don't want to do is shatter the illusion, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and, and show, like, this obviously different... Yeah, well, that's true, too. Right? Yeah, it's not they... like they treat digital artists any better, right? That's yeah. why the digital effects houses are always shutting down and reopening under different names and people getting laid off and not paid enough. Yeah. And they're just not re- really ready to share the glory and the credit and the money. So that's the only one I can think of right off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure that if we thought about it even longer, like had, you know, whatever, we could probably think of some other stuff, but that was the one that popped in. Maybe James yeah. Cameron, because he's done so much inventive shit with technology. Mm-hmm. Didn't he? He like invented some cameras yeah, or something did. like that. And I think... He may have gotten, he may have gotten an yeah, like, uh, award for it, and even the stuntmen, the like Hal Needham is a guy who comes up a lot when you talk when you're when you're looking for like all time stunt coordinators and stuff like that, or stuntmen and everything. He got an honorary award. I don't know if he got it on the broadcast, but he did get one. So I mean, eventually, a lot of these guys do get mm-hmm. some sort of like recognition, but probably not the kind of recognition that they're really looking for. All right. Uh, So one person writes in and says, what is your favorite role in a terrible movie? I love this question. Mm -hmm. I love Dustin Hoffman in Sphere. (laughs) I saw that once. See, now, now, before you go, this is why this question is actually pretty tough for me, because Uh most horrible movies... I don't remember much about them. <laughs> and most of the horrible movies that I like, are that's where I had to go into. I was like, well, that's a horrible movie, but I like it. So I started scanning all that type of stuff, like Ocean's 12 yeah. and all that. Oh, Ocean! I was going to pick somebody from Ocean's 12. Yeah, you know, like Vincent Cassell yes. would be perfect yes, for that. But exactly. uh, anyway, Dustin Hoffman and Sphere. Dustin Hoffman and Sphere. So he's, uh, you, you guys, you've seen it once. Yes. Um, so this was based on a Michael Crichton novel that's actually a very good novel, but it's a very shitty movie. Sharon Sharon Stone and Samuel L. Jackson is in it, and I got to think Peter Coyote, Queen, <laughs> Queen Latifah, I think is in that too. Anyway, Dustin Hoffman has this way; he's playing a psychologist in this movie, and he's got this way of communicating uh, that is very calming. You know, he's got that deep, you know, the deep Dustin Hoffman voice. <laughs> he's like Jerry. He's talking. He's That's talking a pretty to damn good Dustin Hoffman. Jerry, what's the problem, Jerry? <laughs> Jerry. And uh, it's it's shot in this weird way and everything, but he's got a really terrific performance in this. And I'm not going to say it's worth watching, but I just thought that he was definitely <laughs> way above the Sharon Stones and the Samuel L. Jacksons of this movie. Yeah, Sphere is a movie, like, uh, I, I don't know if the Crichton novel came out after Leviathan and Deep Star Six and all that stuff and, uh, and The Abyss. Mm-hmm. But by the time the movie comes out, you're like, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm Leviathan, Deep Star <laughs> Six, and, and uh, um, The Abyss out. You know, all this, like, let's go down deep in the water, deeper than we've ever gone before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything. And it was also, I believe, the same year, like, Levinson did that movie, and he also did Wag the Dog with Dustin Hoffman yeah. as well. So it was like oh, a double man. year for him, or yeah. back to back. And that's a great performance in a very good movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They get the credit. I want the credit. <laughs> Fuck my life. I want the credit. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. All right. So is it my turn? Yeah. Why didn't you use the one you listed in your suggestions? Because I got a little enamored of Dustin Hoffman and Sphere. Well, Alan Rickman in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, then. I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. use as my answer because I think the movie's worth watching just for this performance yeah. because he is just chewing it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Michael Wincott's pretty good yeah. as his foil playing off of him. Uh, it's not a good movie. <laughs> when anytime you've got Christian Slater playing one of Robin Hood's band of merry men, <laughs> you know you've taken a wrong turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Alan Rickman has a bunch of quotable lines. <laughs> Everything is over the top and highly animated. And uh, I just love that. Why a spoon, cousin? Because <laughs> it's dull. You twit. You twit more. <laughs> uh, God bless Alan. Well, Rickman. at least I didn't use a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, uh, I ended up on Tom Hanks and the lady killers. Oh, um, yeah. now I like the lady killers a little bit more than most people, but, uh, Tom Hanks and the lady killers is great. This is, I don't he know is. if I've ever seen Tom Hanks pull out a different kind of character like this. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, Tom Hanks is Tom Hanks. Yeah. There's just different shades of Tom Hanks. This is not Tom Hanks. Yeah. It's like almost like a cross of like 
the Kentucky Fried Chicken Colonel, yeah, like <laughs> an old timey preacher, and he's he's yeah. he's talking like this all the way through, and blah blah blah. <laughs> I really, he's t- using all these big words and everything, and and uh, and it's just completely different from anything he's ever done, yeah. and uh, and uh, and I actually do like the movie, but I understand that it's, I mean, I understand it's not very good, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's one of those type of things. But Hanks is great in it, and it's yeah. amazing. He's the main guy in this movie. And he's still not able to elevate it to people liking it. Yeah. So. Oh, I hated the colonel with his wee beady eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that may be why the reception was so bad to it, because he wasn't he wasn't Tom Hanksian enough. Yeah. And that. And plus it was shooting. Yeah. There's that. He writes in and, and talks about uh, one of his favorite parody uh, movies called A Touch of Cloth. It's actually a parody show. Mm-hmm. Um, and wants to know what our favorite parody style movies are. And this is in our fucking wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up on, on these movies. Uh, I mean, there, if you were really want to know where, like, like, um, my whole comedy like background comes from it's these movies. It's Monty Python. It's Douglas Adams. Yeah. And, and, but, uh, Back in the day, airplane, the naked gun, and top secret. Yeah, those are the three. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, you you put in a maybe hot shots, hot shots part two. You yep. throw those in there. Uh, all the other ones that have come out after that, except for one that you're going to probably mention, um, I don't think get it. They don't get it. It's, I mean, I, the other day, man, IFC loves playing this bullshit a lot of times, man. They like, uh, you're like, uh, the rotten tomato meter has 22% on this. You hit too rotten to miss. Yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. And it's like, meet the Spartans. And, yeah. and, and you're watching meet the Spartans <laughs> and there's like Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt adoption jokes yep. and Britney Spears jokes yep. and MTV and all this other stuff. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> The, you're and even even for the time that's dated yep. yeah and then you watch it 10 years later and you're like uh, who the fuck are these people that they're talking about what's this show that they're parodying or whatever meanwhile airplane is parodying airplane movies that you didn't uh you don't know about but didn't didn't need to know yeah. about and yeah, everything like airport i mean 77 and yeah shit like that yeah it's like airport 77 and they the, the whole thing in fact they gave the i think they gave writing credit to the people who did zero hour uh <laughs> wow. because zero hour if you watch it side by side it's almost the same but not played for laughs that's funny <laughs> like a lot of the dialogue is the same and everything so they gave them a credit uh for zero hour and it and and the thing about airplane that uh is so amazing to me is they got the idea for that because they they recorded the wrong thing one night and it would zero hour was on this tape huh. and they <laughs> just started watching it and they're like man this is ludicrous and everything just to match that that is astounding to yeah. me yeah um those are the three big movies you got to watch those if you're parody movie yeah yeah, yeah. There are really a couple kinds of parody movies I think like your general genre parody movie like what you're talking about mm-hmm. and then uh, I'm going to stick with Alan Rickman and go with Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a parody of a specific property. Yeah. Right? Star Trek. It's not really trying to parody anything else. It's not trying to parody space adventure like Star Wars. Mm-hmm. This is a Star Trek parody. Uh, and the reason it works, of course, is that its jokes are on point And also it has heart and actually mm-hmm. gives us a solid story and characters to care about. So that the jokes aren't all, hey, it's just like that one thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. In right. fact, when they do that, it's almost not for jokes. Like when they finally pan up in the elevator and get to see the ship for the first time in the, in the star helicarrier or whatever it is, that's played for chills. Yeah. The mm-hmm. way seeing the Enterprise is in Wrath of Khan. I mean, uh, there's so much reverence and respect for the thing they're parodying that um, I, I don't know. I can't say enough of good things about Galaxy Quest. It's fucking hysterical. It's really short. If you haven't seen it, just. Yeah. yeah if only for the thermians one of the most hilarious aliens ever invented on film <laughs> oh, no, you're getting to the heart of the matter if you have if you take it and you make it your own thing it's like uh there's a, a group or a dude named girl talk mm-hmm. uh that uh there was a mashup artist right. that made a completely new thing out of existing things mm-hmm. um so, I mean, the two recent examples that I look to are their own thing that can stand on their own two feet. Uh, Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. And Cabin in the Woods, yeah. I would oh, yeah. say, is, is like good. that. 
that by making fun of it, it is their own thing instead of just a classic parody movie. I love Not Another Teen Movie, yeah. but it doesn't give me characters I care about. You yeah, know? Right. and these these two do. Uh, but I got to bring it back to this is Spinal Tap, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and that's another thing that was just you know jokes everywhere but you cared about these people you cared about nigel tufnell Mm -hmm. and uh even though you laughed at like you wanted to see what they did on stage like every performance you were like they're gonna really bring these fucking little people out and dance around the tiny stone (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. he's definitely gonna be caught in that pod this entire time you know right i that movie holds up even with the music as it is, like in the outfits and all that stuff, that movie holds up incredibly well. They, it sure does. The, I think there were the bands back in the 80s uh, said that they couldn't laugh at that movie because it was too real. Yeah, yeah. Like everything that's in the movie is something that has happened. Like, you know, not being able to find the stage. Yeah, right. Getting the, you know, getting the wrong dimensions on a prop or, yeah. you know, that the thing's not opening or whatever. I mean, these things happen and they were just kind of like watching this. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is exactly what happens. Um, hey, I'm glad you brought up Shaun of the Dead because in, in sort of like in the same, uh, you know, category as Galaxy Quest, Shaun of the Dead. Uh, even though it's not really specifically just Dawn of the Dead or or whatever uh-huh. zombie movies yep. or whatever, uh, you know they like what they are parodying and it right. sees and you see that and it's the same with Hot Fuzz too. Yep. Hot Fuzz does that even better, I think. Um, the, all the all the cop movies yep. and everything, and it's uh, it's great. I mean, that's those are stuff that I don't generally consider parody movies right off the bat but i'm glad you brought them yeah because if you do like an epic movie or meet the spartans or a date movie or something like that and you don't have an actual affection for the material it's gonna be a pile of fucking shit yeah. which is what we get with those things yep. right Indeed. and they keep making money so fuck well, yes, them like i said man these guys the uh, friedberg and seltzer obviously watched airplane and naked gun and all that but they took all that other they took all the like pratfall stuff yep. in it and and said that's going to be our movies or whatever and then yeah you're what you're making is something that is good for one week for 13 year olds and mm-hmm. that's it yep my last question is this is somewhat inspired by your 10 minutes of outtakes about nudity <laughs> thank you for listening to that 10 minutes of outtakes about nudity um because it's definitely gave me a giggle in your opinion what is the best and worst use of in film of either partial or full nudity uh they give an example of the uh, star trek where the scientist bullshit um, you know, starts changing in the middle yeah. of the frame and all that stuff. Alice Eve. Uh, and yeah. you guys have serious um, misrepresentations of, of nudity or bad uses of nudity and that kind of thing. So I'll start off because I've got a not so serious. So the worst case of use of nudity is then the devil's advocate, which I love. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's totally fucking unnecessary. Yeah. And, you know, in the middle of the, the church where Keanu Reeves yeah. is like trying to comfort her and everything, she's like, hey, did this to me. And she throws yeah. off her thing. She's completely naked and all like covered in these weird cuts and all that stuff. Right. I never really understand what he actually does to her. Yeah. But I think he cut her a lot. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He must have cut her. But it's some bullshit uh, nudity. I'm not a fan of that. Right. Well, uh, although I will say uh, it's pretty arousing nudity. Now, I'm just saying that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Connie Nielsen's at the end, yeah, yeah. is pretty badass. Not necessary. It's not necessary, it's not, not a, but it's badass. Well, that that could sum up the whole movie. When she's like, when she's like, who am I? Oh, I'm like, yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> I've lost all my thinking skills. <laughs> when Natalie Portman made that movie, I think it was about a painter. I don't remember a friend of mine saying, "I got good news and bad news." Natalie Portman's naked in this movie, but it's while she's being tortured. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> well, and it's, I don't think it's even. I don't think even that you know, like there was anything like that was like she showed anything or yeah. anything. It was just kind of. I don't you, think I ever saw that film. Uh, I know what movie you're talking about. I can't remember the I can't name. Think of, of the it. name of it either. Well, a good use of nudity, I think, is in a weird movie called Secretary, which we talked about oh, when okay. we did that year. Uh, it's Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Spader in this kind of sadomasochistic mm. relationship. I try to be delicate about it because she is a, a woman that's that's abused herself and mm-hmm. has done some self injurious stuff in the past. She's cut herself and that kind of thing, and that's kind of like the movie presents it as kind of her um, push to go into this sort of relationship. But at the end of it, she uh, it shows Maggie Gyllenhaal completely naked, and you can see all of these scars on her arm mm. and on her leg and all that stuff. 
and she is completely happy. She's blissful. She's in this wonderful, satisfying relationships. And I think it's a it's a very, very pretty shot of a very damaged character accepting like you know scars and all essentially it's mm-hmm. a good it's good stuff yeah all right so for my example of a bad instance of nudity i'm i'm gonna take mr spielberg to task with yeah. schindler's list yeah. yeah when you see the blonde draped in the bed with her boobs hanging out now this is famously i was watching this movie with my mother um conservative household i was in college at this point but uh she railed for hours after that movie about how unnecessary that one little segment of nudity was. Now, I'm, at the time, I was like 20, 21. I'm like, I'm okay with it. <laughs> uh, but in hindsight, it's really out of place, both for Spielberg almost never does nudity. Right. Uh, and all we are really trying to do with this scene is show that he's cheating on his wife. That mm-hmm. he's, you know, a Lothario mm-hmm. and he's in bed with somebody who's not his wife. That's really all we need. And we don't need nudity for that. Yeah. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to do that. And so it felt excessive. Um, but I'm going to stick with Schindler's List for my example of a good use of nudity. Because if you took the nudity out of the concentration camps, you take the heart of this movie out. And I don't mean that literally. Right. I just mean the realism of what he shows us yeah. had never been shown to us in drama form before. Mm-hmm. And that they were forced to run around naked and be judged and oh you're too sick we're going to send you over here what I, that's the way it was mm-hmm. and i don't want to see that nudity let's not get things mixed up mm-hmm. but i think if it's not there um he covers them up yeah then it loses it's noticeable something. it would be noticeable if they were out there wearing like cloths of yeah, some yeah. sort you know it just doesn't make any right any sense mm-hmm. whatsoever and you lose a lot of yeah you would lose a lot of the impact for yep. sure um i i could i could talk a lot about nudity <laughs> um the it's funny uh, the um you mentioned schindler's list but he also does basically the same thing in munich oh yeah mm. um and i i don't know if it's because spielberg himself doesn't want to film this that he's i don't know he just kind of wants to because he's got an r-rated movie and he's you know like well I, you know i might as well throw some nudity in there in yeah. munich even there's a point like they kill this woman and like she's in, in a robe or something or whatever and they're like they're like uh no 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 and they they make sure the robe is open they they're like yeah we got they've got to see her like that <laughs> and like maybe that's what happened in real life with those guys or whatever but the way it's shot is just like like i was when we were all discussing this it's like a like a teenager yeah like going well, let's see your boobies yeah. sounds you more know? like the joker in the killing joke like yeah. some oh, yeah, twisted yeah. fucking shit yeah yeah <laughs> not um, only is she dead i want you to see her dead and naked yeah, yeah. <laughs> um the I, there's also i'm gonna i'm gonna go on sort of a three-pronged attack here the holly hunter nude scene in the piano is good because mm-hmm. uh here that is one of those where she is in a horrible relationship with her husband which is sam neil having quite a year in 1993 yeah. by the way um and this awful asshole is harvey Keitel guy though she's falling for him and then finally when it you know when it comes like basically I, if i recall this movie right uh everything that she does costs a key and in, into a into a song or some sort i haven't seen it in forever yeah. it's like everything that she does costs a key or something like that on the piano yeah, that's yeah. what the whole thing is by the time it's over she's she's no longer worried about the deal that she has with Kaitel. She just wants to do him mm. or whatever. And like, you know, there's a nude scene there and it's like, you know, you have been treated awfully by your husband or not neglected by your husband. And it's perfect for uh. this, for this type of thing when it's sort of a coming of age type of thing where, or like, you know, someone's having their, like that it's, they're a virgin or something like that. Being then, born again. Yeah. That type <laughs> of thing. I think it's important to do that because yeah sex with clothes on that doesn't yeah. make sense it doesn't compute and so i also extended this question to include ones where they didn't do nudity and it makes no sense and the number one that always comes up for me is katherine heigl and knocked up oh yeah now yes uh i if, if you ask me do i want to see nudity all the time yes i want to see <laughs> katherine heigl naked uh like you wouldn't believe but <laughs> <laughs> but w- in knocked up there's a it's a scene where she's having sex with seth rogan and she goes 
she goes, uh, he's like, oh, this is just not right. My boobs are flopping around. It's very National Geographic. And she's wearing like a a, a shirt or a, like a bra yeah. or something. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. what? <laughs> no, no, they're not flopping around. I want to see them flop around, but, <laughs> but that's not what we're seeing here. And there's another one in a movie that hardly anybody saw called Wanderlust. There's oh, Jennifer, I saw that. Yeah. Jennifer Aniston, Paul Rudd. Um, there's a there's like a protest scene in there where Jennifer Aniston's on the news and she strips down and yep. she's like yeah to the man and all this other stuff. Everybody else strips down and gets naked, but don't get to see anybody naked. No. Don't get to see her naked. That's the whole point of this whole thing is that you're defying everybody and everything. But instead, they just block you off. Isn't and it that they show it on the TV and it's already blurred? It's out already or blurred like out, yeah. or they or the camera is just just low enough or high enough that yeah. it doesn't show anything or whatever. Yeah, if you're going to be that, if you're going to do that, then you should, I think, do it. And I know that I know that none of this that we talk about can can sound unpervy. There's no way you can get around it. Actually, I was thinking the the opposite. I think we take a salacious topic like that and I think we we kind of I'm t- not treat it I'm not very shy about it is what I'm saying. Yeah. Obviously, like I would rather see these hot actresses naked. <laughs> but I'm not going I'm not demanding it in my movies or anything. <laughs> it's just that there's certain scenes where you're saying certain things or you're doing certain things it doesn't make sense that you're being modest about it. You should just cut the line out or you should cut the scene out if it's not, yeah. gonna, if it's not going to be there. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, I think we talked about this before with Jessica Alba in Sin City. She's, oh yeah. This is a, that's another one she's where playing she, she's playing a stripper, playing a stripper and she's playing a stripper that her old father figure is coming in to see for the first time in years yeah. or whatever. And it's supposed to be a shocking thing. And it's supposed to be the shocking thing, but she's just, she's wearing jeans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like i don't care if jessica alba says that i don't want to do nudity or whatever cast. just don't just don't be in that role give her a different role yeah all right well uh that's gonna be it for this and cast keep going to soundcloud and giving us your thoughts we got a lot of highs i think last, last time one. he said tell us hi or yeah something like that yeah and we got a bunch of highs so this time we should say tell us pickles yeah, and I want we'll to see how many comments we get with people. I want to see high. i want to see so many pickles i want to see pickles <laughs> everywhere i want pickles in my face I mm-hmm. want pickles pickle in my emojis. pants. I want pickle emojis. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we love hearing from you. Keep it up. If you want to go to iTunes, you can do that too. But if you want to communicate more directly, then SoundCloud or Twitter is good to go. Yeah. So that'll be it for this week's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Sherrill. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. All right, you want to do nudity or you want to do... Um... I want to do nudity right now. <laughs> nice. He wants to 11 years might. You might want to You might want to leave. You might want to leave. I was horny because... Yeah, it was a Christian college, and you know, we didn't do a lot. Um, <clears throat> we can cut that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking dying here. Yeah. They got shot! They got shot! <laughs> I'm fucking dying! <laughs> oh, no, I was thinking of that Matthew Lillard thing in Scream where... Oh, you're yeah, fucking <laughs> dying here! <laughs> I was here! You cut me too deep. He starts slurring so much in that scene. Yeah. Oh, there's so <laughs> much <laughs> in middle. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of his default thing. Like in SLC Punk, when he like really gets fired up at the camera, he like is literally spitting on the camera. That's funny. He's like, oh, well, was it the Ram- who started Punk? Was it the Ramones in New York? Was it Sex Pistols in in London? Who fucking cares who started it? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that. That in the commentary for Scream, they said that the way the character was written, there was nothing there. And Matthew Lillard came in and basically made it memorable (laughs) because basically all he's doing is doing all that gyrating and like, you know, all that weird (laughs) deliveries and stuff like that. But he made him into a character. Yeah. Uh, Billy was the killer, right? Yeah, it was Billy Billy and him. Both of them. Yeah. And then Billy's mom did it in Scream 2. Yeah. Yeah. Lori Metcalf. Lori Metcalf. Like, and they did the whole thing like in the first one, everybody thought it was going to be Courtney Cox because she's like got a book to sell and all mm-hmm. sort of stuff. 
And then in the second one, they're like, uh, they actually did make it the reporter this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was one of those type of things. I kind of like Scream 2, though. Scream 2 is well shot. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll agree. Jonathan always brings that up when he brings up Scream 2. Mm-hmm. I agree it's well shot. I don't like it, though. I don't like the movie. Yeah. Better than 3. Yeah, 3 is terrible. Any movie that kills Omar Epps in the first five minutes, I'm not down with. <laughs> yeah. If I said it once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> said it a million times. And who goes into the men's room at a movie theater, hears a whisper in the stall next door, and leans your ear into the wall <laughs> to find out what that fucking pervert is saying? It's kind of it's kind of what's so funny when they do in scary movie, where, <laughs> where it's like a big penis comes through his ear. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> It's that part where uh, James Woods comes in, and uh, he's he's the father and the exorcist and all that stuff. And they're like, "Father, I'm so glad you came." And he's like, "Yeah, it took a while, but I found if I tickle my asshole." (laughs) 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 Fucking James Woods, man! I read all that shit about that. Yeah, how about that? That is insane. Yeah, he's a bastard. Did you see the? The part where he was like, I hope he's, like, he died screaming my name yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Fuck, man. Yeah. He's a total asshole. Note, I will follow you to hell if you libel me, he said. <sighs> yeah. So, I don't think it's libel to say James Woods is a bastard. Mm-hmm. Not literally. I'm using the colloquial swear version of bastard, i.e. a bad person, mm-hmm. a dick, a tool, an mm-hmm. ass face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, libel is is, you have to say something that is absolutely, like, you know, James Cut Woods went into my car. James Cut almost made James Cut. <laughs> I'll drag him into it too. <laughs> Both of them are going to see. <laughs> That's right. James Cut <laughs> and James Woods went into my house and robbed me. <laughs> That's libel. That's ooh boy. That's good libel. Barton Fink's a fucked up movie. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I really. It's been forever since I've that seen that ending. That. Is such an enigma. Yeah. Because, and it, and and like I've never understood when Totoro says, "But why me?" Because he's just Goodman's just said, "Like I come and I help people," blah uh-huh. blah blah, and then he goes, "But why me? Why me?" And he goes, "Because you don't listen." Yeah, and it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> it's I I love Barton Fink, but it's it's a weird movie, man. It is a weird movie. Mm-hmm. Anything, pretty much anything the Coens do. I'll- I'll check out. They're going to make an anthology Western TV show. I know. That's awesome. I'm pumped. What? The Coen brothers are making an anthology show like Fargo or American mm. Horror Story, but it's going to be Western. Ooh. Mm. Yes. It's mm. going to be awesome. That's perfect. Yeah. it's it's. That's why when I tweeted, I was like, sign me the fuck up. This is, this is <laughs> ideal. Every part of that is fantastic. Yeah. Do they have anybody attached to it? Not yet. I don't think. I think they're just writing. Good things happen when they write. Yep. 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 Like uh, intolerable cruelty. They'll somehow find a way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Did you ever see Hell Season? I did. It's been playing on HBO. How, how is it? Not as bad as everybody wanted you to think. Nowhere near as good as the trailer promised. It's got this extended dance scene um, with uh, Magic Mike. Fuck, what's his name? Channing Tatum. Tatum. Uh, he's an actor starring in a musical. And the it's it's ostensibly... The viewer is watching them film this dance scene, but for about five to eight minutes, it's like you're in the musical, and it's very bizarre, but the whole time I was just like, man, La La Land did this so much better. Yeah. Like, it just feels really sterile and not fun and charming. Maybe that's the point. Anyway. Well, there was that the intention for this movie is to do kind of like a like a throwback, like an homage to, to those There's movies? There's a lot of touches that are clearly supposed to be that, yeah. and it's set in old Hollywood. Mm. Um and they name check all these movies and stars from that era. But um, it's funny how much the Coens love that going back and, yeah. you know, into the old days of Hollywood and everything. They do that a lot. Barton Fink. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, even Hudsucker Proxy. Hudsucker, yeah. Has Jennifer Jason Lee's performance is very, you <laughs> yeah. know. Well, and <laughs> hey, it's, I, you know, I, I, it's yeah. the right era, too. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. set in like the 30s or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you can consider this my resignation. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. I didn't send uh, my picks. I've got a couple of. Go them, fuck yourself. Yeah, you're a dick. But I've got a ton of them. 
We can go off. We can go mm-hmm. all over it. All over its face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah. Bukake. Yep. Yep. <laughs> On its face and chest. So you said Bukake. Yeah. In the, uh, in, uh, what was that? The Triple uh, X thing. <laughs> yeah. Ironically. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But I always thought it was Bukake. It is. I mean, I've never really it, heard anybody say it out loud. It is, but it wasn't anything that was worth redoing. I'm proud to not know how that word is pronounced. It was, <laughs> Maybe that's a Japanese pronunciation. I pause for a second it thinking it might be bu-cake. Yeah, it just wasn't <laughs> worth going through the whole, like, let's let's really pronounce bukkake right, guys. <laughs> it's 8 o'clock at night. Let's get this bukkake right. <laughs> I, again, I'm proud to not know. <laughs> Can you do a voiceover and give me three bukkakes? Bukkake, bukkake, bukkake. <laughs> That's right. Bing, bang, boom. <laughs> That's a movie. I do have a surprise question for you guys, too. Okay. A surprise question? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if the theater stories are going to go super long, but, you yeah. know. At we'll least see. one of mine is long. All right. Bring it, baby. Your story is long. The story Very is long. Very long. Very long. <laughs>